Good morning, everyone. Welcome to today's hearing. Today we're going to hear evidence from the Lord Wharton of Yarm, who was uh, at one time a junior minister in the Department for Communities and Local Government. Yes, Mr. Minister. Yes, Mr. Chairman. Good morning to you. Good morning, members of the panel. I now call the Lord Wharton of Yarm. Good morning, Lord Wharton. I understand that you're going to affirm. Yes. Well, the words are there on the screen in front of you. Would you please read them out? Mm -hmm. I do solemnly, sincerely and truly declare and affirm that the evidence I shall give shall be the truth, the whole truth and nothing but the truth. Thank you very much. Please sit down and make yourself comfortable there. Yes, Mr. Minute, when you're ready. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Lord Wharton, good morning. Morning. Can I start by thanking you very much for coming to this public inquiry and assisting us with your evidence? We're extremely grateful to you. If you have any difficulty understanding any of my questions, uh, please just say so, and I can put the question again or I can rephrase it so <coughs> you can understand it better. Can I ask you, please, also to keep your voice up so that the person who sits to your right uh, it can get down on the transcript everything you're saying clearly and accurately. Also, please don't nod or shake your head. You have to say yes or no, as the case may be, so that the transcript can reflect your, your answer. Um, if you need a break at any time, other than the scheduled breaks that will take mid-morning and mid-afternoon, then please just say, uh, and, um, and uh, it, we can take a break if, if need be. Now, you've provided two witness statements to the inquiry. Can I show you your first, please? Um, it's at CLG 3030834. Uh, and there it is on the screen in front of you. Everything that I'm going to show you will, will appear on the screen in front of you. This is the first page of it, dated the 20th of April, 2021. If we go to page 19, please, you'll see that there is a date of the 20th of April 2021, with your name above that and your signature. Is that your signature? It is, yes. Yes. Uh, and have you read this statement recently? Yes. And can you confirm that its contents are true? Uh, yes. Thank you. Can I please now show you your second witness statement to the inquiry, CLG 3034289. <clears throat> there, there it is, 12th July 2021, page 12, please. Signature again. Is that your signature? It is, yes. And have you read this statement recently? I have. And again, can you confirm that its contents are true? They are. Have you discussed your witness statement or your evidence with anybody before coming here today? Only my legal team. Right. Now, I want to start by asking you some questions about your background and your role. First, what qualifications do you hold? Um, I'm a qualified solicitor. Um, and I have my higher educational qualification is an undergraduate degree. In what subject? Law. Law. And um, between 2010 and 2017, I think you were the MP for Stockton South, is that right? That's correct. Uh, and what was your career history before 2010? Uh, I was a solicitor and before that a trainee solicitor. Right. And which firm were you with? Were a you with? firm called Black at Heart and Pratt. I think they then renamed BHP Law in the northeast of England. Right. And on the 11th of May 2015, you were appointed Parliamentary Under Secretary of State for Local Growth and Northern Powerhouse at the Department of Communities and Local Government. That is correct. And that was after the Conservative government came to power on the 7th of May 2015, I think. Uh, yes. Yes. And you stayed in that position, I, I, you tell us, I think, until 17th July 2016, when you became Parliamentary Under Secretary of State for International Development. Uh, yeah, that sounds about right, yes. Right. Now, we're going to focus on the period 11th of May 2015 to 17th of July 2016, so there's 14 months or so, yes. when you were working at the Department for Communities and Local Government, DCLG, and, or the Department for short, if you like. Now, between 2011 and 2017, I think it's right, isn't it, that there were no fewer than three Secretaries of State for the Department and five junior ministers with responsibility for the building regulations. Uh, that may well be correct. I haven't counted them. Uh, right. Um, well, let's see if we can just do a quick uh, inventory. Um, Eric Pickles, Secretary of State, 2010 to 2015, a, a matter of historical fact. Yes. And during his time, um, there were three junior ministers, Andrew Stunnell, Don Foster and Stephen Williams, the latter 2013 to 15. And then Greg Clark took over from Eric Pickles as Secretary of State in May 2015 and Sajid Javid from him in July 2016. 
Yes? Yes, that's yes. correct to me. Uh, and you may not have these dates in your head. I, I know they're hard to hold, but I'm just giving them to you so that you can um, remember them. Now, I think it's right that you were the junior minister with responsibility for the building regulations from the 11th of May 2015 until the 17th of July 2016 with Greg Clark as your Secretary of State. Yes. Yes. Uh, you, I think, took over directly from Stephen Williams, didn't you? Yes, I did. Yes. And then Gavin Barwell, now the Right Honourable the Lord Barwell, took over from you in July 2016. Correct. Yes. Now, during your tenure, the Permanent Secretary was Melanie Dawes, yes? Yes. Yes. And she was, the, was she the Director General with responsibility for the building regulations? Sorry, she was the Permanent Secretary. Um, was Peter Schofield the Director General with responsibility for the building uh, regulations? I couldn't. Honestly, say I, uh, I mainly dealt with uh, Bob Ledson on building regulations issues. Exactly what the the titles and the hierarchy were, I can't recall in detail. Right, you mainly dealt with Bob Ledson. Insofar as I dealt with officials, yes. Insofar as you dealt with officials at all. Well, most of my engagement with the department would be through my private office. When I had had meetings on building regulations, insofar as I remember, the, the person that sticks in my mind was Bob Ledson. Right, <coughs> um, he was deputy director wasn't he? Uh, if you say so, yes. I, I don't recall his exact title. Right. And did you not remember that the um, officials above him with responsibility for building regulations were Sally Randall as director June 14 to April 16 and Steve Quartermain taking over from Ms Randall in April 2016? I, I don't recall. I'm, I, I recall having meeting when I had meetings about building regulations, uh, the person I remember was Bob Ledson. Um, since then, and, and clearly I've, I've followed some of the inquiry and I'm aware of some of the documents, I see there were others involved. Some of those names and faces are somewhat familiar to me, but my overriding memory was it was Bob Ledson that I dealt with. Okay. Now, at paragraph four of your statement, which I don't think we need to turn up, you tell us that when you joined the department in May 2015, uh, you had a number of responsibilities, and, and I'll, I'll list them by way of inclusion. First of all, Northern Powerhouse, supporting the um, Secretary of State on city deals. Yes. Yes. Um, and then European Regional Development Fund. Yes. Uh, enterprise Zones and Local Enterprise Partnerships. Yes. And I think also acting as Supporting Minister on the Devolution Bill up after November 2015. Yes. And then things like planning casework. Yeah. Building regulations. Yes. And, of course, in the normal way uh, of an MP attending to the needs of your constituents. Of course, yes. Yes. How did you ensure that you were able to provide leadership across those num that number of work streams that you've agreed you had? Um, interesting question. Uh, you, uh, as a minister, when you first arrive, you spend a period of familiarisation, which I went through being briefed on different aspects of my portfolio, and then in individual meetings with um, either internally appropriate um, people from the department uh, or externally with appropriate stakeholders, you would respond to submissions and questions and give guidance on direction uh, where you felt that you, you were inclined to do so as the minister. Right. When you say give guidance on direction where you felt you were inclined to do so as the minister, um, where would that direction come from? And would it come from your knowledge of generic government policy or some insight into technical matters? Um, or both? Uh, I wouldn't claim to have uh, great technical expertise in a number of these areas. That's you rely on the advice you're given for your technical understanding. Um, but then the role of the minister is to take an overview and say this is the direction in which I would like us to travel or as a department us to go or work to be focused. And I would I would do that. I see. Uh, and did in relation to what you describe as direction of travel. Uh, would you consult with the Secretary of State? Uh, in, sometimes, yes. In matters where you were unsure, perhaps? Um, there would there'd be issues in which the Secretary of State took an interest. So, uh, fundamentally, the Secretary of State is in charge in the yeah. department. They, um, it's not, I don't think it's prescribed exactly how responsibilities are then allocated to ministers. So, to take the example of that job when I was in it, the Northern Powerhouse role was what the Prime Minister asked me to do uh, when I was appointed. When I arrived at the department, there were a number of other uh, roles and responsibilities that ministers needed to take on, and the Secretary of State decided to whom they would be allocated. And so, uh, that portfolio, some would be core to what the Prime Minister asked me to do, some would be things the Secretary of State asked me to do. Where he had a view, he would have uh, overridingly be in charge, and his view would 
um, take precedence over mine. Uh, in other areas which were of less direct interest or less political focus, then I would be left to do the work myself or, or oversee the work of the department myself with relatively little oversight from the Secretary of State. Yeah. And <coughs> have you any insight into why you ended up with building regulations? Not particularly, no. Right. Uh, now, you say at paragraph six of your first statement, and I don't think we need to go to it, uh, that the building regulations formed a small part of the work you undertook in the department. Yes. Now, if we look at paragraph nine of the, of the statement at page three, at CLG 3030834, page three, you say this in the third line. <coughs> Amongst other things, they, that's your um, officials, um, would screen and triage submissions and correspondence before I would see them, and having regard to my workload and according to the priority attached to the submission, would place it in my ministerial box for me to consider. My private office would generally pass me more than a dozen ministerial submissions a week, requiring varying levels of input. I did not have a special adv advisor or SPAD. <clears throat> uh, and if, uh, uh, I'm sorry, I'm going to show you two more parts of your statement, if you don't mind. Uh, paragraph 17, if you go to paragraph 17 uh, on... Uh, on page uh, seven, sorry, page six, um, you say, as, as stated above, I was and am not an expert in, the building, in building regulations and was largely guided by the advice of expert officials. In light of this, in practice, the officials in charge of the building regulations team retained responsibility for overseeing and ensuring the progress of work in relation to building regulations, including the simplification of approved document B. It is worth mentioning, however, that I do recall asking the building regulations team whether the review could be completed more quickly, but it was explained to me that it was a complex and inherently lengthy process that could not be foreshortened and that it was in hand, and I accepted this. Now, I'll come back to that latter part of that paragraph um, shortly. Um, finally, if I can just show you uh, page 15, paragraph 37. At, at 37, you, uh, you say, uh, in the second sentence, my private office shared with officials any correspondence I received in relation to fire safety, and I was briefed by officials as and when they or I considered appropriate. Now, I've shown you quite a lot of, of your statement there, but having looked at, at it all, first, how did your private office determine the priority of submissions? Um, I'm speculating, as I, I can't speak directly for my private office at the time, um, but there would be various things that would, would push um, either a submission or a piece of correspondence um, up the hierarchy, as it were. So, for example, correspondence from a member of parliament would be more likely to receive a direct response from me. Correspondence, as I understood it, from members of the public would often be responded to by an official and not seen by me. Regarding submissions, they would take into account, I, I, again, I'm, I'm speculating, as I, I, I've never worked in a private office, but I would expect them to take into account um, urgency, um, the, uh, their perception of political uh, focus attached to an issue and to make a judgment as to when it should be submitted to me and where, or indeed whether it should be submitted in the form to which it was uh, supplied to them. Right. Now, what you've just told us um, sounds all very logical, but why did you need to speculate? Did you not know how your officials triaged issues? In detail, no. Why is that? I, well, I, it's my understanding, but I've never worked in a private office. They are um, sort of rather mysterious places, I think. Right. When you came in as minister, did you not want to know how the private office worked so that when there was a triage process in place, for which you, of course, were ultimately responsible as minister, you at least understood its mechanics? Yes, and what I've described is my understanding of how it worked. But day to day, I, I, I didn't see that work. Right. You didn't see the work of triage, but did, yep. did somebody sit you down and tell you how it worked, or is what you've told us um, generality by way of your observations and experience over the time you were there? Uh, I don't really recall. I'd imagine it's a bit of both. Um, if you work in a political environment, you know how these things work. If you've been a minister, you know how these things work. Um, I'm sure I will have had briefings on this when I first arrived in, in post, but I, I can't remember how much of what I've just told you is my general understanding and how much I was told at the time. Do, do you accept that your function as a minister uh, and parliamentary undersecretary included acting as a decision maker on any issue concerning the building regulations? 
uh, any issue that required ministerial decision, yes. And can we agree that uh, inherent in that function was the obligation to challenge or question the advice of officials? Yes. Yes. And do you accept that those obligations were unaffected by the fact that you were the junior minister and the person with the ultimate responsibility and decision-making function was the Secretary of State? Yes. And also, do you agree that as minister in charge of building regulations, you retained responsibility for oversight of any review of the building regulations? Yes. Yes. What would cause you to seek out advice unilaterally on your part on a particular question in relation to fire safety or the building regulations? Uh, it, I mean, it could, it could be it could be anything from someone raising a someone could raise a concern with me, a piece of information of which I'd been unaware. It could be a, an, an interest that I had personally to want to pursue an issue. Uh, ministers have quite wide discretion to ask questions and seek further information. Did you have? Uh, a personal uh, interest in any particular aspect of the building regulations specifically or fire safety more generally? Uh, not that I recall. No. Do you, did you meet Peter Schofield, the Director General, uh, with any degree of regularity? Um, I, I, I don't honestly recall. I'm sure I will have met him on quite a number of occasions, but I, I can't tell you whether it was a regular meeting or something that just took place. It was quite a long time ago. And does the same go for the directors, Sally Randall and then Steve Quatermain? Uh, I honestly couldn't say. Again, I'm, I'm, I'm sure from what I've seen of the documents that I will have met them and engaged with them, and they seem familiar to me somewhat, but I don't remember specifically the individual meetings I had with them. And you recall meeting... Bob Ledson, he's the one who sticks in your mind. Yes. Did you meet him regularly or just a lot? Um, I would say more a lot than regularly. There wasn't a regular scheduled meeting that I, can, that I can remember. Now, you say in your witness statement at paragraph 10, your first statement, that uh, you don't recall the name Sally Randall, Richard Harrell or Brian Martin. Is that that's right, is it? That was correct at the time of the statement. Um, I, obviously, having been aware of the work of the inquiry, those names are somewhat more familiar to me now. But I, at, at that time... I, I didn't recall them. No. Uh, did the majority of the, advi the advice that you received in relation to fire safety and the building regulations come from Bob Ledson? Uh, logically, I would say yes, from what I, re I remember. As, as I said, Bob was the person I primarily remember as talking to me about the issues around right. uh, building regulations. Right. Were you aware that Bob Ledson was what is called or was called a policy professional, but who had no technical expertise? I don't recall specifically being aware of that, now. Right. Does it surprise you? Uh, not necessarily. Right. Um, who else do you recall receiving briefings or oral, oral advice from in respect of fire safety or the building regulations? Uh, my private office. I would discuss submissions and matters with my private secretary and assistant private secretaries. Um, and then outside bodies. I recall meeting with the all-party parliamentary group. Um, beyond that, uh, I'm not sure I can recall specific individuals. And your, pri your private secretaries, um, could you just list the names? Uh, primarily in this space, uh, my, my private secretary was Kay McKendrick and the assistant private secretary was Sarah Morgan. Right. And that's care as in K-E-R-R. -R. That's correct. Right, thank you. Now, when you were appointed, do you remember a formalised or even an informal handover process from Stephen Williams? No. Did, no you meet, sorry. did you even meet him? No. So when you arrived as junior minister, how, how did it work? Were you just shown into an office and given a part of papers? I mean, that, it, it, was, it is a bit like that, yes. Um, my, so you, you are shown into an office and given a pile of papers, introduced to your new private office, who are the, the civil servants who run your life as a minister, as it were. They were then arranged for me a series of briefings on the areas of policy for which I had responsibility. Right. Um, and when you were shown into the office and the desk containing the piles of paper, had you any, any particular understanding or insight into the building regulations or the approved documents? Um, so the, I mean, the article question is no, but I mean, just for clarity, I, I was shown into an empty office. <laughs> right. I so, the desk and chair, was it? Uh, yes, yes, but no papers that I <coughs> Yeah. So you really were a blank, a blank slate? Yes. Right. Uh, uh, and and, and can, can we take it, you didn't come into the empty office <coughs> with any particular insight into or interest in the building regulations? That is correct. 
Um, I want to ask you then about your knowledge of the building regulations. Um, to what extent during your time as junior minister did you become familiar with the building regulations and the system for building control in England and Wales? So I don't recall the exact timeline from memory. I am familiar with some of the documents that, that I, I did see at the time. Um, what is normal and what I remember taking place uh, as, a, as a process was a, a, a series of briefings on the different parts of my portfolio in the first few weeks that I was in post. That would be a combination of written submissions and notes and then meetings with relevant officials to talk about work that was being undertaken, issues that were potentially on the agenda and about which, over which I needed to take a decision and to familiarise myself and to familiarise me as the new minister with the portfolio. Um, did you come to know that the statutory scheme involved the imposition of overarching functional requirements or what I might call performance requirements? Um, I, th I think so, insofar as I fully understand your, your question. I was given a briefing on how the, um, the building regulations <coughs> work, the role of the approved documents, uh, and I'm given, a, 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 as I say, a, 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 I think it, in, it, is, it was appended to my witness statement, um, a document that summarised the current position of the department regarding building regulations and work that was being undertaken. Who gave you that briefing? As, as far as I recall, uh, Bob Ledson. Right. Uh, did you uh, gather an understanding of the overarching aim of the functional requirements? Uh, I think so. Right. Did you gather an overarching understanding of um, functional requirement B4 about external fire spread? Um, I understood the document B generally. I wouldn't have a granular understanding of individual parts within it. Right. Did you look at it? Yes, I was given all of the relevant documents at right. the time. Did you look at it with a lawyer's eye? Uh, I'm not sure I understand that question. Well, as a trained solicitor, given a piece of statutory guidance uh, hanging off the back of a statutory piece of statutory regulation, did you not want to see how it worked? Well, I, I, I recall being briefed on how it worked and feeling that I had a, a, a general understanding of, of how the building regulations worked. Yes, I didn't, and I wouldn't claim to have gone in detail line by line through a document um, about which I had very little uh, technical expertise. Right. Uh, did you know at least this much, that Part B <coughs> of the regulations, <coughs> excuse me, and particularly approved document B, was about fire safety? Yes. And therefore, life safety? Yes. Yes. Uh, did you know, or did you come to know, that the approved documents were for the purpose of providing practical guidance on how to meet the functional requirements of the building regulations? Yes, I, I believe that was in my, my early briefings. Did you learn anything about how the department sought to keep up to date with current practices and trends in the building industry so as to be able to um, issue or review or amend the practical guidance? Uh, yes, again, I was um, briefed on the role of the Building Regulations Advisory Committee and the work that the department did and the work that they had proposed in their, their timeline at, at that time. Right. Did you know about the work done by technical policy officers to anticipate new developments in the construction industry? Uh, I would today in a limited sense yes so for example I knew BRE and, and I was briefed on the, the sort of work that they did uh, I can't <coughs> I in honesty recall the detail of the, of the understanding I had at that time of technical work that was done by individual um, uh, officers within the, within the department What were you told about the relationship between government and the BRE? That they were an advisory committee to ensure that the, that the government understood the impact of building regulations on um, the sector uh, and that government was getting feedback on how they should operate, where they were working, where they weren't. Um, and it was, a, it was effectively a, a, a relatively qualified stakeholder group that, that would inform government decision making, as best I recall. Right. Did you, you say in that last answer that you understood that they were an advisory committee. Uh, did you <coughs> think or were you told that there was a formal relationship, a formal nexus between government and the BRE? Um, Insofar as I think they, 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 were, they sat under the department. I, I understood it to be a formally established group. It wasn't an ad hoc group or a, an entirely external body, to the best of my understanding. It was something that the department used. M Mr. Millett, I think there might be a misunderstanding here. Can we just clarify whether you are asking the witness about BRE or BRAC? BRE? 
Sorry, I yes. was answering on BRAC. That's my, my, no, no, sorry, that I, I answered the question on BRAC. Right. Uh, on BRE, I understood it was an external body that tested materials and undertook the, that's that sort of technical scientific work. And going back to the question then, uh, what were you told about the relationship between government and the BRE? Sorry, uh, that the BRE's role was, I think, they were, as, I, as I recall, they were an independent company, but they undertook work for the government on the testing of materials and other such technical um, investigative work that might be required. Uh, did you ever take any steps yourself to satisfy yourself that the work done uh, by the technical policy officers uh, at the lower echelons of um, the official hierarchy was effective in keeping the approved documents up to date and fit for purpose? Um, I, other than asking sort of general questions when I was briefed on them and discussed them with officials, uh, I don't recall having commissioned any additional <laughs> work to uh, investigate the quality of what they were producing, no. Uh, did you understand at any time that officials were forbidden or at least strongly discouraged from advising uh, members of the public, for which read members of the construction industry, of the intention underlying the language in the approved documents? Uh, no, I don't think so. Right. Now, I want to ask you one or two questions about deregulation. Um, before I do, can I just ask you this? Bef apart from the drafting of the building regulations and the production of practical guidance to assist industry in complying with those regulations, did you understand the department to have a role in overseeing the regime generally? Yes, I did. You did? Did you understand that the, the department had, or at least should have had, some degree of regulatory oversight? Uh, yes. 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 And in other words, making sure or keeping tabs on uh, industry to ensure that it knows what's required uh, by the building regulations and yes, the approved documents. Yeah. Yes. And, and similarly, identifying any uh, common uh, problems with misinterpretation, misunderstanding, or non-compliance. Uh, I I, again, I don't know whether I, I had that discussion in those particular words, but I, that would be in line with my understanding of the department's role. Yes. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Now, um, I, I want to ask you about deregulation in light of that. <coughs> um, one in, one out. Is this right? Was an administrative policy introduced in tw 2011 uh, by the coalition government? Yes. Uh, I assume it's a matter of historic record. I, I was familiar with one in, one out. And I was familiar with a, a desire to be generally deregulatory. Um, whether it was introduced in 2011 and exactly by whom, I couldn't, I couldn't tell you. All right. Um, when you uh, came into, go uh, into government in 2015, um, I think it was one in, two out, which had been introduced in 2013. That sounds familiar. Right. Did anybody ever sit you down and explain how the one in, two out policy worked? Not that I recall, no. Were you ever given any documents to show or regulations or protocols or guidance yourself? And to ha I, I, I don't recall having seen any documents, no. Right. What did it mean in your mind? Um, from my memory, it wasn't something given particular um, or, or undue focus. I was aware of a general wish to be deregulatory where appropriate. Um, but this, I became a minister well, two and a half years after uh, 2013, as you described the two in one out, which I, I take your word for. I don't remember being briefed on it particularly. Uh, it was just a, a general view that being a, a erring on the side of de being deregulatory as opposed to uh, uh, creating additional regulatory burden would, was seen to be a good thing. And at a very basic level, of course, you know, one in, two out, I mean, if you want to bring in a new regulation, you've got to find two that you're going to take out. Right. Did you understand how that worked as a matter of mechanics? No, I don't feel that it was a, a particular pressure on my um, decision making or, or my role as a minister at that time. I don't remember it being a particularly uh, salient or pertinent issue. Did you ever discuss 
one in two out with your fellow junior ministers? I don't recall having done so. Or the Secretary of State? I don't recall having done so. Or with any of your officials, particularly Bob Ledson? Uh, I don't remember discussing it with Bob Ledson. I think I have had, on at least one occasion, a discussion with my private secretary about it. Um, I suspect, and I don't remember this clearly, and, and so I have to be open, this may not be a, an exact description. I, uh, I don't think it was, a, it was anything to do with the, um, the subject matter here, but at some point the issue of, of one in two out coming up and my private secretary explaining that uh, it would not be, uh, to, it wouldn't be in line with government policy to do things that created lots of new regulations. But I don't think that was anything to do with building regulations at the time. It's a general discussion about something else. Right. So it sounds from what you just told us that the deregulatory uh, agenda was uh, simply an atmosphere in the department to which you might or might not pay regard rather than um, a fiat, if you like, a set of rules with which your officials had to comply. Um, that was how it felt to me at the time. That said, I, I don't recall having tried to introduce a, a, spe a particular new regulation, at which point I'm, it may have been uh, may have st stopped being an atmosphere and become rather specific because if a junior minister tries to do something that's against government policy and they tend to be told about it and they, they get they, before they got too far down the track. Did that happen to you? Not that I recall. It didn't? I don't recall it happening to me, no. Right. You probably would recall it if it did. I, I would think so, yes. Yeah. Um, did you um, ever pass on any guidance to those carrying out the work on the, on <coughs> the building regulations and the approved documents? Um, uh, regarding the applicability of the deregulatory agenda, or if I could put it this way, the one in, two out rule. I don't recall. Right. I don't recall having done so, but... Uh... Right. So, do, do, do you remember ever telling Bob Ledsom or any other official uh, that, the direct, that the deregulation agenda, and I use the phrase because you use it in paragraph 18 of your own statement, that did, that, that agenda... Um, did not obstruct changes to regulations or guidance relating to fire safety? Uh, I, I don't recall specifically, but that would be a... I mean, logically, that would make sense to me. I mean, my, my understanding of what was the work <coughs> that was proposed, and I don't want to uh, jump ahead to parts I'm sure you'll want to discuss um, later, but my view of a proposed piece of work on, on simplification would be that that is inherently a, a positive and arguably deregulatory thing to do. And so I'd, I wasn't aware of any work that was being undertaken by the building regulations team that I thought would um, cause concerns in, in terms of increasing regulatory burden. Right. Well, while we're on the point, what was your view at the time about a change to the approved documents, which are, after all, statutory guidance to guide compl compliance with a re regulation, uh, which was clarificatory? In other words, clarified the existing intention of the Secretary of State underlying the language in the approved document. I, I would consider that, and did at the time consider that to be a positive thing to do. Therefore, not something which required to be matched with two other deregulatory changes. No, I would see that as a reduction in regulation rather than a new or, or additional new regulation. I, I... Right. Can I show you what Mr. Martin has said in his statement? Can we please have Mr. Mar Brian Martin's statement back up again? CLG 3019469, page 87. <clears throat> um, he says this, and there's an underlying document which we could go to, but this is a shorthand. Um, on 16th July 2013, Secretary of State Eric Pickles wrote to Nick Clegg MP and Vince Cable MP seeking clearance from the Home Affairs Committee and the Economic Affairs Reducing Regulations Subcommittee to consult publicly on the results of the recent review of the building regulations and housing standards. The pro forma for the request was included. I note that the Secretary of State includes a line in his letter that housing standards are not within the scope of the one in, two out system. I'm not able to say what the Secretary of State meant by housing standards, but as I set out above, it was my understanding that building regulations were within the scope of the one in, two out system. Uh, now, Mr. Martin confirmed the view that he's expressed there about his understanding at the time in that last sentence in his oral evidence to the inquiry on day 252 at page 146. Uh, where I, and, and let's go to that. Day, day 252, page 146, uh, and if I can show you, uh, 
Thank you. Um, look at line 12. Question. Was it your understanding throughout that the one in, one out and one in, two out policies apply to guidance under the regulations, including the approved documents? Answer, yes. What was the basis on which you understood that to be the case? Answer, I'm sure it's something we discussed at various points, but it's pretty, it would be a fairly pointless policy if it didn't impact on the technical guidance supporting the building regulations. Uh, line 22, well, that's an argument, but if were you ever told it applies, or did you ever read a document or an instruction or a protocol or policy that told you that ADB or any of the approved documents were subject to these policies? Answer... We had, a, we had a fairly regular interaction with colleagues in the business, Department for Business, I can't remember what it was called at the time, and there's a better regulation executive there, it's a team of officials with, that deal with regulatory policy. Uh, now, um, that, was his, um, that was his evidence, and we've seen his evidence also in his statement. Um, against that background, can I then show you the letter that he's referring to, CLG 3019227. And if we, th there it is, uh, addressed to Nick Clegg and Vince Cable in that order, 16th of July 2013. Uh, I appreciate this is more than two years before you come on the scene, but, or about two years before you come on the scene. But if we go to page three in it, please, in the third substantive paragraph up from the bottom, uh, he says, um, does Eric Pickles, uh, this is a red tape challenge measure, and I'm advised that housing standards are not within the scope of the one in two out system. Now, we know that the Regulatory Reform Fire Safety Order 2005 had been specifically exempted from the government's red tape challenge in 2012. W when you came in as a minister, were you aware of that? No. You weren't. Uh, do you agree with, from the best of your recollection, with what Mr Martin has said in his written statement and his oral evidence uh. about building regulations being subject to the one-in, one-out, or one-in, two-out agenda. I, I don't recall having ever thought about the one-in, two-out agenda in relation to building regulations. I can't, in all honesty, say that I had a view on it at the time, or if I had a view, I can't recall what it was. <coughs> Can we go then to CLG 1000-7860? Now... This is a letter from the, the late Sir David Amos MP, dated the 1st of December 2015, uh, to you. Uh, uh, now, we're going to come back to this letter in some more detail later in your evidence. Just f for context's sake, it was written a few days after you had, you had attended an informal lunch with the APPG, at which Mr Martin uh, uh, and others were present, on the 26th of November 2015. So that, that's the context. Uh, and that's what's referred to in the first paragraph of the letter, as you can see. Now, if we go to page two in this letter, before the numbered list, it says this. At yesterday's meeting, you gave some steer, which we understood to be, and then there is a list. Uh, and if you go down to item six in the list, it says this. It is acknowledged that there is a political policy of not increasing the burden of regulation. Simplification is necessary, and should one measure be introduced, it would need to offset by the removal of two others, depending on validity. Now, uh, I should also tell you, of course, that this letter was entirely in the context of the revisions to ADB uh, and the pressure that a APBG was seeking to bring on central government uh, to get on with the revision. That's the context. Looking at item six, and what Sir David has said there, was he correct? Uh, I don't know. I don't recall having said that at the meeting with the APPG. It's possible that I did, but I have no memory of it. And I don't recall having considered um, the one in two out policy in relation to building regulations or as particularly uh, relevant to the work that was proposed to be undertaken in reviewing of uh, the Part B uh, ABD. Right. But I, I, I can't say that I have a, a perfect memory of that uh, that meeting, which was a long time ago. It, it strikes me, looking at that, the the one to six list, that it is quite comprehensive and specific. And I would be quite surprised that if at an informal meeting I made commitments with that clarity. I mean, the, the reality is you try to avoid making too firm a commitment in informal meetings because you need to get advice and and 
consider what you're going to do rather than decide things when you're meeting people at the time. Yes, I understand that. But Sir David was quite clear not to use the word commitment. He said you gave a steer, or some steer, and he was simply recording the steer that he understood. And as you can see from six, this, one of the steers that you gave was an acknowledgement of the um, political policy of deregulation. Um, if your understanding was that any changes, and particularly clarification or simplification, of the building regulations and the approved documents was not subject to your un in your understanding at the time to the deregulatory agenda. Why did you give that steer? I said I, said, I don't recall having given that steer. How, however, my and, and I'm, my only hesitation here, I, I, what I don't know is because it was quite a long time ago. How much of this is my understanding because I've thought about it since, and how much of it is what I felt and thought at the time, it's difficult to recall. Right. However, my view of taking an existing document and simplifying it is that itself would be most likely deregulatory anyway. I don't see why that would trigger the one in, two out at all. That said, the one in, two out policy was not something that I remember being particularly influential in my time as a minister at DCLG. Right. Now, you've given us what you call a logical answer, and I'm not, I won't comment on that one way or the other, but did you ever check the understanding that you've just told us about here with anybody um, in, in either in the department uh, or, or in the, the department's legal department or w with anybody else? I don't recall having done so now. R right. Um, it, your, re your recollection of this is perhaps understandably n not as clear as it could be given the time that's elapsed since, but you're not able to quarrel with what Sir David says here about what you had said at the meeting, at least given some steer on. I, I, as I can't recall, no, I can't say with any certainty what I did or didn't say. I, I, all I can, the only observation I can make is that I would be surprised if I'd been as specific in generality of these six points as they would, would convey. Right. Now, I'd like to look in a little bit more detail with you at um, what officials in the department thought. We've seen a little bit of Brian Martin's evidence <clears throat> um, let's show you something else. Can we please go to day 255, page 19 of Brian Martin's evidence? And if we go to page, line, page 19, line 19, he says... This, uh, and this is, I should just tell you, this is now February 2016. Uh, he says, yeah, I think at this time we really struggled to get anything done within the department. It had been difficult, you know, following the coalition government taking over after the financial crisis. There was a lot of pressure on the team in relation to deregulation and so on, and that had continued to magnify over the following period. Once we got past the 2015 election, we had a combination of an even greater ambition towards deregulation. Regulation was a dirty word, and there was so much political disruption, it was very difficult to get any kind of traction. And any document that would have gone out from the department would have needed to have had a political approval. So I think at that stage, it would have been incredibly difficult to do that. Uh, and if we go on at, line, at page 35, line 6, same transcript, uh, he says... Um, looking at the policy area was raising standards was going to be incredibly difficult under that, under the regime we were working under. Uh, and then finally, I just want to show you one more uh, a piece of his evidence, day 255, page 37, two pages on. And if we look at line nine there, he says, government position was that committing more resources to fire protection or any other regulation was, you know, the opposite of where the government wanted to go. So you need a very strong evidence base to justify an increase in requirements. And that's what he told us, and I've given you quite a bit of his transcript. Are you able to explain why it was that Mr. Martin had formed the view that the building regulations were within the scope, at least of the one in, two out policy? Uh I'm not. I have. I have no reason to believe that. The, I, I didn't. I don't recall having had a view on whether they were within or outside of it. Um, I still, when I consider reviewing any doc a document that exists, wouldn't fully. I wouldn't think that that would trigger <coughs> the um, 
the provisions regardless, because if you're simplifying and amending something that exists, it doesn't strike me as a new regulation. However, I accept I, I'm not hugely familiar with the, the details of that policy. Uh, the only other observation I'd make is, is reading the evidence that you've, you've just put before me there, is uh, Mr. Martin's other comments do chime with my recollection. It was a, 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 a despite being a continuation of half of the coalition government, it was a very new government. Uh, felt very new, and very quickly there were a lot of political events outside of the specifics of the work that, for example, Mr. Martin was doing, that meant it was an incredibly busy time. And so when he says that there were a lot of political, th- I can't remember the exact word he used on the other page, but saying there was a lot going on in politics, effectively, that's very true. But are you able to explain why Mr. Martin formed the view that building regulations were subject to the one in two out policy? I'm, I'm not, but they, they may well have been. I, I would say I, I didn't, I don't recall the one in two out policy having come up in relation to any of the work that was proposed on building regulations when I was there. And so I, I don't remember having it, it even arising as an issue where it was a cause of concern. What I would expect is if we were proposing to do something that would run into a policy like that, which therefore may or may not be possible or it might have implications for it, uh, I would expect to have had a discussion about that and been told we, we should do this, but the, one of the problems is this policy. I don't remember having ever had that discussion. Right. Now, can, can I show you what Richard Harrell said to us on day 243? Day 243, page 51, please. And at lines 1 to 7, he says this, when you issued an updated approved document, there was a cost to industry in familiarising itself with the revised document, and that was captured by the impact assessment process. Gosh, so simply that, simply the cost associated with looking at a revised simplified approved document, yeah, that was deemed to be a cost to industry. Yes, even though the substantive requirements had not changed and then he corrects himself, might be regarded as a benefit to industry if the savings from the clarification were greater than the cost of the time taken to familiarise yourself, but it would be subject to impact assessment work on that basis. And that's in the context of of deregulation. And my question is, were you aware at any time that this was the basis on which officials in the department were working, namely that their hands were tied by the one in, two out deregulatory policy? Uh, No. You weren't? No. I, mean, I would expect almost any change to be subject to an impact assessment of some sort, but I wasn't aware that that would trigger the one into our policy. I, that and would, and would it, raise were you also unaware that it was envisaged by these officials, certainly Brian Martin and Richard Harrell, that the government's deregulatory policies would include uh, impact on parts of the building regulations concerned with life safety? Uh, I don't recall it having been raised with me or discussing that. I, as I, say, I don't recall having discussed one in, two out um, in relation to building regulations. And I'm, for the best of my rec- recollection, my understanding at the time would have been that a simplification of a document would be an inherently good thing and it would be deregulatory. So, right. no, I wasn't aware that the, the view of officials was that this would uh, be subject to those provisions. Are you able to explain why you were ignorant of the attitude taken by these officials towards the deregulatory agenda and their understanding, based on the evidence I've shown you, uh, that it applied even to a clarificatory or simplificatory change to the approved documents? Um, I would think because no one said to me, this is a problem that we have or this is a concern that we have that's stopping us from acting. Um, And the context in which I was operating at the time was I understood that there was to be a comprehensive review of some of the documents, particularly Part B. And so work was planned. No one was saying to me, oh, but this work can't be done or, or, is, or there is some impact on this work that we, that we feel is stopping us from doing what we should do. Um, and so if, if I wasn't told about it, I guess I didn't know. So you weren't aware, is this right, of a culture within your department of constraint based on an understanding of the Uh, application of the deregulatory agenda to matters of life safety that you, now you're being asked about it, did not share? Um, I think that's right. I I won't be clear. I think there was a general view that deregulation is a good thing and unnecessary regulation um, would be something we should avoid, but I wasn't aware that that was in any way constraining work in the area of fire safety. And indeed, my understanding is that a comprehensive piece of work in this area was planned and, and 
being progressed. Now, we know that the building regulation division never gave consideration to whether any of its work might legitimately count uh, as a ex subject of an exemption from the one in two out policy because, for example, life safety issues were in play. Are you able to explain why that is? Uh, no. Are you able to explain why it is that no official, as we've been told in that division, took any advice on whether, uh, if clarification of the building regulations or the approved documents was all that was required, the one in two out policy was engaged? No. And again, what's the reason for why you are not able to explain those things? Uh, because my understanding was there was, there was a piece of work that was planned, uh, and I was, so far as I can recall, never told this is a problem that is getting in the way of that work being undertaken. So it, it, given that the advice I was being given <coughs> at the time was we are going to do this piece of work, it is going to be comprehensive, and no one was saying to me, oh, but there's a reason that we can't do it or won't do it, I, I don't know why I would therefore even think to ask that question. As far as I understood, this was something that was going to go ahead. Right. Who had the responsibility in the department to ensure that the officials working on and responsible for the regulations, building regulations and the approved documents understood precisely the scope of the deregulatory agenda and its application to their work? Fundamentally, I would, I would think the permanent secretary, but I I, mean, I couldn't tell you exactly who, whether that was delegated to somebody else or which, for which, which civil servant was responsible ensure, for ensuring that that was part of the department's policy process. But it would be something at, at, at that side of the way the department works. But was it not something over which you had responsibility or accountability? Some, yes. So can you explain, can you account for why it is that your understanding uh, of the impact or effect of the deregulatory agenda was not just not shared by uh, the officials at the coalface in the department, but actually that they thought the opposite? Well, I, as I say, I, uh, my understanding was that the work that <coughs> they were being asked to undertake or proposing to undertake was being put in place, and at no point do I recall someone saying to me, there is this problem or this hurdle, and so I, I didn't even, I would imagine, I, I'm thinking about it, mean, I don't see why I would have thought ah, he, he, you have, is this going to be a problem for us when everyone was saying this work was going to happen? Well, what about the steer that you'd given at the 26th of November 2015 lunch? I know you can't recall it, but it, on the basis uh, that Sir David Amos's recollection in his letter five days later of that lunch is more perfect than yours is now, was, was this not on your radar? Well, as I say, I can't recall it. I, I, at no point do I, do I recall the deregulatory agenda being something that got in the way of work that was going to be undertaken in this, this part of my portfolio. Were there any checks and balances in place within your department at the time, so far as you understood it, to make sure that life safety issues were not unacceptably compromised by the deregulatory agenda? Um, I don't remember any specific policies, no. In general, in government, looking up or down, were you, were, were you aware of any safeguarding mechanisms within the deregulatory agenda that would mean that officials and ministers such as you would stop and think before refusing to um, simplify or clarify or amend regulations which had to do with life safety or health and safety more generally? So I'm not aware of anything specific, but as I say, it's, it's something that you would expect to be highlighted if it became, if, if there was any concern you would expect that to be raised, and I don't recall it at any stage being raised, and indeed quite the opposite, as far as I was aware, work was planned. Are you able, Lord Wharton, to account for why the deregulatory agenda was regarded by your officials at the time as a constraint on their freedom to review and amend the approved documents if, in fact, according to your understanding, it wasn't? Um, I am not. It was never raised with me. It appears to be something that... and. Uh, was, was that came in that, that came into place before I arrived at the department, but then at no point did, did, do I recall anyone saying to me, "This is a constraint on what we're trying to do in this area." As I say, I'm in danger of, and I, and I apologise for doing so, repeating myself. My understanding at the time was work was to be undertaken, and I don't remember anybody saying there is something that is stopping us from undertaking that work, and that is this particular policy. Well, let's, let's then turn to the work. Um, let's look now at the coroner's recommendations following the Latinal House 
in Camberwell in London in July 2009. Now, we're going to come later to your br uh, initial briefing on the Building Regulations Division when you joined the department in May 2015, shortly. But as an initial point, let, let's just look at this. Bob Ledson, when he gave evidence, told us that um, he could not recall mentioning the Lacknell House fire or the coroner's recommendations to you in your first oral briefing. That's, that was his evidence, and just for our purposes, that's day 241, page 212, line 19. Nor does he recall sending you a copy of those recommendations at the time of that meeting. Is that your recollection? Um, I, I don't recall when I became aware of them, so that's perfectly possible, yes. And do you remember when you did first learn about the Lacknell House fire? I don't. I remember at some stage being aware of it, but I don't remember exactly when that was. When did you first learn that there had been a coroner's inquest and that she'd made recommendations? I would suspect at the same time, but again, I, I don't right. recall the exact meeting or document in which I was um, made aware of that information. Did, did you ever take a look yourself at the coroner's recommendations which followed the inquest? Uh, I, I remember having seen, or well, I can't say exactly when, the letter from then Secretary of State uh, Eric Pickles at the time. I don't recall having gone further than that and looked into the detail of the specific recommendations from the coroner. Right. Do you remember when you saw the Pickles letter? I don't. You say you, look, you, you looked at it. Uh, what was the context in which you looked at it? Do you I, I don't recall. Let's look at the coroner's letter, please. CLG 401870. Um, this is the letter dated the 28th of March 2013 to Eric Pickles, the then Secretary of State, on the subject of the Lacknell House fire, 3rd of July 2009. And um, this is the formal Rule 43 letter. Um, looking at its first page, can you remember when you first saw this document? I can't remember when I first saw this document, no. Uh, can we take it that you did see it at some stage? Uh, I, I, it is familiar to me. I can't tell you when I first saw it. I, I genuinely can't remember. Well, can I just, let me see if I can just pin it down a bit. Do, can we take it that you saw it at some stage during your tenure as junior minister? I, I honestly can't remember. I know, I, I, it's familiar to me as a document. I recall seeing the secret, that Eric Pickles' reply to it. Um, it's quite possible I saw this when I was a minister, but I can't honestly say with, with clarity that I recall it. It was a, a long time ago. Well, let's see how we go then. Um, <coughs> it, it, if we turn, please, to page three, we can find the recommendations that the coroner had addressed to the, to the department relating to the building regulations and approved document B. Uh, and um, if we scroll up a little bit, please, we can see the heading. And given your um, lack of recollection of it, I'm going to take a little time just reading it to you. It says, Building Regulations and Approved Document B. During these inquests, we examined Approved Document B, 2000 edition, incorporating 2000 and 2002 amendments, ADB. I'm aware that ADB has subsequently been amended and believe that a further amendment is due to be published soon. The introduction to ADB states that it is, quote, intended to provide guidance for some of the more common building situations, close quotes. However, ADB is a most difficult document to use. Further, it is necessary to refer to additional documents in order to find an answer to relatively straightforward questions concerning the fire protection properties of materials to be incorporated into the fabric of a building. Um, and then we have, against that background, the recommendations as follows. It is recommended that your department review ADB to ensure that it... And then you see three bullet points. Bullet point one, provides clear guidance in relation to regulation B4 of the building regulations with particular regard to the spread of fire over the external envelope of the building and the circumstances in which attention should be paid to whether the proposed work might reduce existing fire protection. Bullet point two, is expressed in words and adopts a format which are intelligible to the wide range of people and bodies engaged in construction, maintenance and refurbishment of buildings, and not just to professionals who may already have a depth of knowledge of building regulations and building control matters. Third bullet point provides guidance which is of assistance to those involved in maintenance or refurbishment of older housing stock are not only those engaged in design and construction of new buildings. Now, looking at the first bullet point there, do you accept, looking at it, that it refers clearly to the need for clear guidance on external fire spread? Yes. Yes. Uh, now, let's then look at your first statement. 
um, please. Uh, page 4, paragraph 13. <coughs> you say uh, there, shortly, ta- shortly after taking up my ministerial post in May 2015, I requested a briefing from the building regulations team. As part of that briefing on 28th May 2015, I was sent a forward look. This document included reference to the coroner's recommendations and the previous government's aim to review and simplify approved document B by 2016-17. It indicated that officials intended to issue a discussion document publicly setting out its proposals by the summer recess. Uh, Now, is it right that Bob Ledsom was the official who provided you with that briefing? Uh, Yes, I believe so. I think my my sort of introductory briefing as, as... as best as I recall, was provided by Bob Ledson, yes. Can we then go to page 15, paragraph 34? Uh, And if you look at the second line in that paragraph, you say, uh, this made clear uh, that the principal issue for MHCLG in terms of fire safety was to review, simplify, and clarify approved document B. It remained my understanding that this was the key issue. Did you understand at the time that this project was, indeed, to review, simplify, and clarify approved document B? Yes. And did you think that that was by way of response to the coroner's recommendations? I, I, I don't recall exactly what I thought at the time, but, but logically, that, yes, that would make sense. W- what were you told about why that work was being undertaken? I, I don't recall. Did you consider at the time that the coroner's recommendation was a requirement? for a fundamental clarification or change of ADB and not simply the desire for plain English? Um, Well, the the coroner's recommendation is a a recommendation, um, but it it struck me as an obviously good thing to do if there were concerns either about the content or the clarity of the document to have a process by which it was reviewed and improved. Hmm. Were were you told by Bob Ledson what the, the underlying problem was which had emerged at the Lackland House inquest, which which had necessitated uh, the, uh, well, as you understood it, um, the um, review, simplification, and clarification of approved document B. I don't recall. Did, did, did you not remember asking him or him telling? I, I don't recall. I don't. I don't recall the, the, the detail of the discussion we had in that meeting. Right. Does it follow you also don't recall asking him what technical parts of ADB would be included in that review? I, I don't recall. Right. Did you, have an, did you come away from that meeting with any kind of understanding? I know you can't remember, but at least remembering that you had a, an understanding of what, of what was required. Um, well, as I said, I, I don't recall. I recall the meeting only vaguely. Uh, however, from, again, looking at it, and, and the, the only concern is I don't want to apply hindsight, but uh, if, if it, was, it was explained to me what was proposed, I will have asked questions that I felt were appropriate and come away feeling that that was a, an appropriate course of action because I thought it was a, a, a positive thing to do the review that was being talked about. Did you ever uh, ask yourself or ask any of your officials whether there was a, a, a record um, kept relating to the Lacknell inquest by the department? So, for example, a file which had um, the evidence the transcripts, the recommendations, the response of the Secretary of State, uh, um, the briefings that have been given to the Secretary of State? I don't recall having done so, no. No. D- did you know that, in, in fact, there was no proper record of which recommendations had been accepted, which rejected, and what precisely the work the department had committed to do was? Uh, I don't, re- well, uh, I didn't ask whether there was a file um, regarding a proper record, I don't know what form that necessarily take, but I would assume, and I had separate occasions when um, coroner's letters came to me on, on other issues, whereby there would be a process by which advice was given to the minister. The minister would make a decision, and I would assume ministerial decisions are recorded properly and are appropriate record kept. Right. Do you, let me try it slightly differently. Do you remember coming away from that meeting with Bob Ledsom, where he briefed you about Lacknall, with any particular understanding about whether the coroner's recommendations were to be, or had been, uh, accepted uh, or rejected? I don't recall. Um, what I, what I, I recall uh, understanding that the changes that were going to be made to approved document B were in response to that and addressed some of the issues that had been raised. Uh, I don't recall in more detail what my understanding at that time was. Do, do, do you remember at least having an, a a vague inkling as to what work had been done to date 
and what work remained to be done in relation to the coroner's recommendations? As, as I say, I have very limited recollection of that meeting. Right. We'll, get, we'll turn in more detail, I think, next to that briefing. Um, it happened on the 26th of May, 2015, and we have an email to confirm that. Let me just show it to you so you can be sure about what I'm telling you. It's CLG 402008, page 2. Uh, and as you can see from the foot of the page, uh, it, there's an email from you to Bob Ledson, copy to Sally Randall, Peter Schofield, and your, and your, um, your, is it your, pu your private secretary, PS. Yes, the email's from my PS. I wouldn't send emails to officials myself. No, I, I mean, presumably you would see this before it went. No, not necessarily. Um, in fact, unlikely that I would do so. Would it not be copied to you? No. Right. Hi, Bob. Thanks for briefing the minister earlier. So I think that's all we need for this. That's the date. I don't think we need anything else uh, from it. Um, but th there it is. Uh, now, you say in your first statement, and we don't need to go back to it, um, largely because we've already looked at it, that it was you who requested a briefing from the building regulations team. Yes? Uh, it will have been on the advice of my private office, and the request will have been sent by my private office. So when I say uh, it will have come as the minister would like a briefing from, but the, the administration of it would have come from my private office at the time. Right. Did you... When you say it came from your private office, was it you who wanted the meeting, or, or was it something that your private office thought would be a good idea uh, and convened without even... Awesome. Well, no, I mean, I, my private office, again, uh, I don't recollect exactly the detail for, of how this meeting came about, but my private office will have said, we propose a series of meetings to familiarise yourself with, uh, to familiarise you with your portfolio. Do you agree to have these meetings? And I would say, yes, I do. Right, OK. Um, <coughs> was it... Uh, well, um, was it your understanding, uh, or so far as you can recall it, the understanding of your private office, that the principal issue for the department for discussion was the review, simplification and clarification of approved document B. Uh, I remember that being the, the key piece of work that was um, being planned. So yes, I mean, whether I, that exact four years, I can't speak for my private officer's understanding, but that certainly became the main thing we were expecting from the uh, building regulations team. Right. Now, if we go back to your second statement, please, let's look at that. CLG 3034289, page 2, paragraph 5, fourth line up from the bottom, you say, at, at some point I became aware that the building regulations team is preparing for a, a review of the building regulations and associated guidance, though I cannot now recall whether this was mentioned in the briefing or sometime later. Now, is it your recollection that it was you that requested this meeting? Um, no, I will have agreed to the meeting, and I the see. request will have come if, if, in order for the meeting to happen. I think, it, well, there's only two ways it could have come about. Either the team would have asked for it, or my private office on my behalf would have asked for it. Right. Um, what is most likely is my private office recommended it, and I said, yes, that's a good idea. I see. So, at all events, whether it was you or your private office, the impetus for this meeting had come from you or your depart your office. I, I can't say that that is um, absolutely the case. Do you have any recollection of being told anything about the review of, of ADB, approved document B, at that briefing? I, I don't recall. Now, before that meeting, you were sent uh, a, a one-page brief and a set of slides, and I think you addressed that in this paragraph here, yes? Yes. Just above it. Yes. Now let's look at those slides. CLG 1 triple zero seven zero two two. And as you can see, um, on page one, there is a promising title, an introduction to the building regulations. Did you, does this trigger a recollection? Is this the slide pack you were shown? I, I, I'm sure it is. Um, I don't re recall whether I've shown it then or have seen it since. I'm, right. I'm familiar with the doc somewhat familiar with the document now. R right. But I, I, I genuinely can't remember whether I've shown it at that meeting or not. When you were sent it, did, did, did you look at it? Uh, again, I, I have seen it. I can't remember when I saw it. And it would be sent to my private office, not to me. Right. But there'd be little point, wouldn't there, sending it to your private office unless you were going to look at it? I, I would agree with that, yes. yes. Did you? I, as I say, I'm, I can't remember. I remember having, I have seen it. 
and I think it is highly likely that I, that I was shown it and it would be added to my papers by the private office, in which case I would have seen it at the time. But I don't right. have a, a clear memory of when I saw it and, and what, uh, what I thought of it at that time. Um, now, I'm not going to go through all of these slides with you. You'll be glad to hear. But let's go to page four. Uh, and we see there um, a photograph and a question. Why do we have the building regulations? Now, the, do you recognize the photograph? Uh, yeah, well, I think I do now, but no, not at the time I wouldn't have. No, I think it's Roland Point, isn't it? I'm not sure exactly which building it is. I, 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 there's a danger I will make a mistake if I try and remember the, right. uh, the name. Uh, and it says, why do we have the building regulations? To deliver basic minimum health and safety standards to protect the public, particularly householders. And then uh, the last bullet point, to provide a cost-effective level playing field for builders. Uh, and then uh, if you go to um, page 16, And we can, we can run through this document um, at some length, but just picking some points out, page 16, key drivers for making changes to the building regulations are, and here they are, deregulation and simplification, supporting government policy priorities, such as energy efficiency, as you can see, keeping the system up to date, ensuring the regulations and supporting guidance reflect latest technologies, building practices, and standards, and that they are operating as intended, Responding to new issues, climate change, and implementation of European legislation. You see that. It, 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 at least on that, was that something that you understood at the time? Uh, again, I don't know. I can't remember when I saw this, but that, I, I mean, those things seem logical points to me. Now, the only reference we see in, in this document to approve document B is page 8. Uh, and on page 8, uh, we can see... Uh, a, a little heading, ensuring bad things don't happen, uh, and a, 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 a sort of montage of pictures. Do you remember this? Does, this? does this ring a bell with you? Again, it looks familiar now, but I yeah. don't recall when I first well, saw this. Part A structure, and there is what I would mm. suggest is Ronan Point as a photograph. Part B, fire safety, and there's Lacknell. Yeah. Part C, contamination and moisture, and there's <coughs> England and Wales. Uh, and other things as well uh, of interest. That's the only reference to Part B, fire safety, anywhere. Uh, and there's also a reference uh, on page 11 to means of escape. Um, other than the picture, the photograph under Part B that we've just seen on page 8, there's absolutely no mention at all in this document of Lacknell House. Um, are you able to explain why that is? No, I didn't prepare this document. No, I know. But are you able to explain now why it is that your officials did not put anything about Lacknell House, the causes of the fire, the fact that six people had died, the fact that there had been an inquest, the coroner's recommendations, or the Secretary of State's promise in response to you in this pack? No, I'm not. Looking back on it, do you consider that surprising? Yes. Can you account for it? Uh, how, how do you mean? Well, can you explain it? No. Were any concerns raised with you at the time regarding insufficient checking of building work or a race to the bottom arising from a risk of competition in the building control system? Uh, there was, a, there was an, an ongoing debate around approved inspectors. Um, I remember that being primarily focused on uh, there was a combination of the, sort of the private competition nature or local authority nature of approved inspectors and, and creating more access for people to do the work and concerns that had been raised, I think, by uh, parliamentarians with constituent issues about a misunderstanding of the role of an approved inspector. Um, for example, um, I remember it being raised that they want, there was a view that they should approve the, for example, if you buy a new house, the approved, if it's, got, it's, been, if it's been signed off by an approved inspector, you should expect it to be of a certain quality, where the role of an approved inspector is not, not to do that, but to ensure it meets the regulatory requirements rather than the aesthetic requirements or whatever it might, else it might be that people would want. So there was a general public misunderstanding about the role of approved inspectors that was raised on a number of occasions by parliamentarians. That is, insofar as I recall, the, the debate around that. And what was happening on that? What, what was government's response to these concerns at the time? Um, I think the main concern that was being raised by other MPs with me, and it was only a handful, um, was actually that there was an issue of misunderstanding of the role of approved inspectors, where people thought if they bought a house, 
that had been inspected, that everything about it would have been inspected rather than it would be inspected for the legal requirements or the requirements of the regulations. Right. Um, I, I don't think there was a great body of work to address that. It was something we were trying to... Uh, I remember there was one a German debate in Parliament about it. It was a matter of trying to explain the role rather than amend it at the time. Thank you. Uh, Mr Chairman, is that a convenient moment? Yes. <coughs> yes, I think it is. Um, <coughs> Lord Orton, we have a break halfway through each session, and this seems like a good time to have our morning break. So we'll stop there. We'll resume, please, at half past 11. <clears throat> and uh, I, I'd ask you, as I'd asked all the other witnesses, please don't discuss your evidence or anything relating to it with anyone while you're out of the room. Understood. Right? Thank you. Thank you very much. Would you like to go to the usher, please? Thank you very much. Half past 11, please.
Would you ask Lord Wharton to come back in, please? Five pages. Right, Lord Wharton, you're ready to carry on. I am. Um, before you do, can I just enter a little plea that you try to keep your uh, s uh, speech a bit slower? Because I think the transcribers having difficulty sometimes in keeping up with you. You're not alone in that, I may no, say. Apologies, uh, of course. Mr. Millet is as much to blame as you. But if you can, it would help her, I'm sure, a lot. Yeah. Thank you very much. Yes, Mr. Millet. Yes, Mr. Chairman. Can we please turn to CLG 30s 19274? Uh, now, this is an email sent by Bob Ledsom to your private office on the 28th of May 2015. So two days uh, following the briefing from Mr. Ledsom. You see that? Yes. Uh, and uh, it's, uh, it says it has an attachment called Forward Look May Cover Note 150528 Forward Look May 2015. There are two attachments. Let's look at the first of those, which is at CLG 30s 19275. <clears throat> uh, and this is the first of the cover notes uh, entitled Building Regulations Forward Look, dated 28th May 2015, from Bob Ledson to you. Uh, and uh, it, it, it's, it, I think it's fair to say, and correct me if I'm wrong, that this document sets out um, at the very highest and broadest level the priorities of the Building Regulations Division. Yes? Uh, I mean, I, I don't. I mean, I'd it says it attaches the forward look up to early autumn. I mean, and it has immediate issues. I don't know whether it, I don't right. know it assigns priority to them. Well, let me try it this way. Did you did you look at this at the time? Do you think? I, I'm sure I would have. Yes. Now, if we go then to paragraph four, we can see forward look. Uh, the attached table provides a forward look up to early autumn. Immediate issues are, and then if you look at them, it's decision on way forward on zero carbon response to the proposed changes to the London plan, and then agreeing approach to implementing part of the EU broadband directive. Um, nothing there about a review of uh, approved document B or the coroner's recommendations following Lackland House, is there? Uh, no, although I would, I, as I say, I don't recall what, I don't remember what I thought at the time, but looking at it now, I would uh, suggest that point five refers to that, but you're right, it's not um, pulled out in the, the, those bullet points under point four. <coughs> No, and looking at point five, we will advise also in due course on issues for building regulations in response to government deregulation policy, including opportunities for further simplification. The timing of this is as yet unclear, however. But again, there's no reference there to a review of approved document B or the coroner's recommendations. Uh, not specifically, no. Do you recall discussing uh, that topic, the topic of the simplification uh, of approved document B and the building regulations at that meeting? Uh, I don't recall exactly when I would have discussed it. I know it's something that I discussed on a, a number of occasions. D do you agree, looking at the document, because it looks like that's all we've got, that any simplification of the building regulations was being presented here in the context of a response to government deregulation policy rather than the coroner's recommendation? recommendations from the Lacknell House inquest? In, in this document, yes. Yes. And was that the context of the discussion? Do I, remember? I don't recall. Can you explain why the, the simplification of the building regulations was in the context of deregulation rather than the recommendations arising from the inquest? No. Let's go to the second attachment. CLG 3019276, please. And this is uh, a, um, a, a, a table entitled Building Regulations Key Decision Stroke Issues June to October. Uh, and uh, if you uh, look down, uh, you can see the fourth item down, fourth issue down, fire safety. Uh, and if you look under the decision column, it says, publication of discussion document on technical changes to fire safety provisions in building regulations, particularly changes needed to follow up previous government commitments to the coroner after the Lacknell House fire. Uh, now, just on the little I've shown you so far, do you recall seeing this document at the time? Uh, I don't recall this document, but I would imagine I would have seen it. Yes. And if you look under timing, 
uh, in the timing column, fourth item down, it says, end June. The previous government committed to taking forward to changes needed in response to Lackland House fire in 2016 to 17. We would like to issue the discussion document before the summer recess. Now, uh, were you, um, did, did you note uh, the timing there of the proposed publication of the, of the discussion document? I, I don't recall. You don't recall? Do you remember whether you understood what the technical changes to fire safety provisions were? Um, I, I, again, I don't recall, but I wouldn't think that I would understand the, the technical detail of the changes. I was aware that changes that there was a proposal to make changes to the document. Right. Did you ask? I don't, did you, did I don't, you, I don't recall. Right. Or did you just think that this was for the technical team working away far below you for them to work out for themselves? I don't think I would have thought of it in those terms. No, not in those terms, perhaps, which perhaps are a bit stark, but did, did you think to yourself at the time, I'd like to understand these technical changes because they're to do with fire safety, or did you think, I don't need to understand these technical changes to fire safety because I'm not really qualified to do so and there are better people qualified? I, I don't recall. What was your general approach to me when you were presented with things that were described as technical? Um, I don't think I had a, a general approach for things described as technical. My view of this is that there was a proposed piece of work that would improve, simplify, um, address issues that had been raised with one of the documents. Uh, there was a plan for that work to be undertaken, and I followed the advice of officials and approved, where appropriate, progress towards delivering that, that end. Right. In the right-hand column, as you can see, uh, uh, the author of this document, Bob Ledsom, had set out the fact that previous <coughs> government had committed to taking forward changes needed changes needed in response to Lackland House fire in 2016 to 17. Did you ask what the changes were that were needed? I don't recall. Did you not want to know exactly I, what the previous government had committed to? I, I'm not saying I didn't ask, I'm saying I don't remember. Um, to the best of your recollection at the time, did, did, was it your understanding that the review involved changes to technical requirements? Um, uh, and as I say, I'm, 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 my, my nervousness is that I don't want to apply what I think now and, and reinterpret what I, what I do remember of my, my view at the time. But I think my view at the time would have been that, um, as it what I was briefed was going to take place, there would be a simplification and amendments made that were in line with the requirements. So some would be technical and some would be simplification. I think there's, there are issues of cross-referencing and it being a complicated document to read and so on as well. So it would be a mix of changes and there was a proposal for a process under which that would be that work would be undertaken. And the deadline, as we can see, and I'm, I'm assuming you understood, because it's clear, was end of June 2015. Uh, the proposal for publishing a discussion document, I think, was before the, the recess, yes. Yes. Did you come to appreciate that it was in order that the scope of the review of ADB could be determined, that there should be this discussion document? Uh, again, I, I mean, that, I think that is, that is my understanding. I can't recall exactly what I understood at the time. Um, the impression that I do distinctly remember having was that this was a, a, a quite a comprehensive piece of work. It wasn't just some small changes. It was a significant body of work needed to be undertaken to properly um, review and amend this document. Did you, at this time, and, and at any event before the summer recess, ask Bob Ledsom or anybody else in the department how work was progressing on the discussion document? Uh, I, I know that at a number of times the progress of the overall review was something that I asked questions about. I can't tell you specifically what questions I asked about this document, as I, I don't recall. Were you aware at the time that progressing the review of ADB was, at least in the minds of the officials in the department, contingent upon publishing this discussion document? Uh, again, uh, that would make sense to me. Uh, I think you know, to, in, order to, in order to have a review process, one of the first things you do is talk to stakeholders about what should or should not be included in that. So, yes, that makes sense, but I don't remember exactly what my understanding or this was at the time or the discussions that I had at the time. Right. <clears throat> when it says the previous government committed to taking forward changes by 2016, 2017, did you ask about what those commitments were in any detail? Uh, again, uh, I don't recall the specific discussion that followed from this document. Did you ask then or about that time how work was progressing to deliver on those commitments by the deadline, 
2016 to 17? Uh, whilst I know that on a number of occasions I asked what, what about progress with this process overall, um, I don't know whether it was in reference specifically to that deadline. And at some point, uh, I suspect it became clear that this, would, this work was taking longer than it should. And I would imagine that that discussion included that. But again, I don't, I'm not recalling having seen this specific document, I don't recall exactly what followed from it. Um, you can see it says 2016 to 17. What did you understand by that? Uh, I would, my understanding of that would be that that gives the, the time frame in which a lot of the completion work on this document would be expected, and it should be completed by the end of 2017. So I would read that effectively as no later than the end of 2017. I see. Melanie Dawes told us, as I think did others, uh, um, Bob Ledsom, that that meant uh, end of the financial year 2016-17, so end of March 2017. Was that not your understanding? That wouldn't be my understanding, but uh, that it's possible it's not written in clear <coughs> terms. So does that mean that um, the deadline would be anything between the 1st of January 2016 and the 31st of December 2017? in your mind? I, I would say that the way that's written is open to that interpretation, yes. Right. Did you have any feeling in your mind about what, a little bit more precisely than a, a two-year period, was indicated or intended by a target date? Uh, no. I knew it was a comprehensive piece of work um, and that it, it would require a significant commitment of resources, but it was one that we had agreed to undertake and uh, at that that, that deadline was, was set out to me in this document and I think in others, but I didn't have a, a more granular feeling for it than that. Right. Looking at this document, are you surprised now sitting there that this document or documentation set sent to you, which was intended to give you a high level overview of the most important issues in the building regulations division, that technical changes to fire safety provisions uh, relating to government commitments was buried away in the fourth line of this table, a second attachment to an email, not highlighted in the briefing note or in the covering email. Yes, I am. Mm. Can you explain how come? No, I, I, I didn't uh, write the document. I could speculate, but it's not. I, I can't say no. why it was set out the way it's been set out. I mean, do you accept that, that this project should have been front, of, front and centre of the issues upon which your mind was to be concentrated? Yes. Mm. Not least because it was safety critical. Safety are critical and a, a timeline had been given, yes, absolutely. Does this reflect the department's overall attitude to the importance of this project? Uh, I, I can't say. I mean, does, does this tell us that amendment of approved document B, important though it was to life safety, had been allowed to sink into the morass of other priorities competing for air in the stifling atmosphere of the regulation? I, again, I may not uh, use those terms, but I would agree that this is not given the prominence that, looking at it now, I would expect it to have been given in the briefings that I received. Now let's go to CLG 1007034. This uh, is an email from your private office following the briefing, dated 28th of May uh, 2015. <coughs> <clears throat> and uh, if we go to page two, uh, we can see uh, that uh, is an email, there is an email from your office to Bob Ledsom, 26th of May 2015. Hi, Bob. Thanks for briefing the minister earlier. To follow up, the minister would like a short note which covers a forward look of key issues uh, which will arise over the next few months key bodies that we should set up meetings with, and if possible, how pressing it is to meet with each of them. It would also be great if you could send up the existing one page of summaries you mentioned. Now, if we go back to the, to the top of that thread of that email run, um, we can see that on the 28th of May, 2015, Bob Ledsom emails Sally Ran Randall with an attachment called a war book 2015, importance high. And he says, here are the one pages we've prepared on difficult issues. There's an intervening email, which I don't think I need to show you. Um, and you could see the war book referred to. What I want to do is show you the, show you the war book and ask if you uh, had seen it before. CLG 1000735, page two.
And uh, here is the document, fire safety part B and sprinklers. Background stroke issue, while the number of fires and fire casualties continue to fall year on year, fire safety in buildings remains an area where government is continually pressed to do more. Now, did you read this document at the time, do you think? Uh, I don't recall, but it's likely, and the, the overall impression that it gives um, accords with what I, f I feel was the impression I had of this uh, part of work at that time. Well, that statistics told you that all was well, but some people weren't satisfied and were putting pressure on government? Um, I, certainly rem I certainly remember distinctly being told that uh, fire, death by fire was reducing year on year and that the current system was working well. Who told you that? I don't recall. Was it one of your officials or somebody? Yeah, one of my officials. I was told it within the department, but I don't. I, it was the over, overarching impression I had of the way the building regulations was operating from the advice that I received was that they were, were as, as a set of, of documents, <coughs> an area of policy working well, um, but there, there was work proposed to make improvements. If it was working well, did it occur to you to un, uh, seek to identify why improvements were made and what improvements were needed? Well, um, no, I mean, I, I was aware that there was proposal for simplification in response to the, the coroner's letter. Right. I, I can't recall exactly when I became aware of that, but the impression that I was given throughout was this was a system that was doing its job, but there were changes planned that would make it better. The system that was doing its job, how did you relate that impression, on the one hand, to the coroner's recommendations, so far as you knew what they were, on the other? as I say, that, that there were changes that could be made that could improve it, but nonetheless that it was fit for purpose as it was presented, as I inherited it as the responsible minister at the time. You, you say there were changes that were made, made that could improve it at the time. Um, making, improving changes to approve document B, mm -hmm. I think you would accept, wasn't something that the department would do without some need to do so. Um, well, I, my understanding was that there would be a complex piece of work that would take into account <coughs> a number of factors that may lead to a better outcome, better documents at the end of that work. So there was a plan to undertake that work. What I wasn't under the impression of is that there was something obvious and straightforward that should be done immediately to, I mean, I'm paraphrasing my view at the time. So the impression I, uh, the impression I had was, this is a system that is working, but where there might be improvements that we can make and there are things that we should take into account, we have a plan for doing that. I, I, I'm, just, I'm just seeking to understand how you could have that impression, given that six people had died in 2009, and that the inquest the coroner had, had recommended what I've shown you in her recommendations letter, and that that had been responded to by government. I mean, was your impression that all was well with ADB and that these changes were uh, just for the sake of improving it, on the one hand, or was your impression that changes were needed to ADB because six people had died as a result of a defect in the regulations, or at least uh, a potential defect in the regulations? My impression was that ADB was working well, but there were lessons that could be drawn from that in that, that tragic incident, uh, and that there was a process being proposed by which that work would be undertaken but that it is not a straightforward thing to do and it's a complex area and that would take time and require quite a considerable amount of engagement, consultation and thought. Uh, you will appreciate, and, and this is a view that I, I would have had at the time, I would think, that making the wrong changes could have a detrimental effect to something that, on the evidence that was being presented to me, was resulting in reductions in the number of deaths by fire year on year. So it was important to get it right. Did you have a, any thoughts about what the statistics actually represented, that although fire deaths were falling year on year in the sense of frequency, those statistics told you nothing about severity, the kinds of incidents in which people were dying, or the kinds of incidents in which they weren't dying, but where risk was building up. The impression I was given, and I relied on the advice that I was given, <coughs> is that uh, things were improving year on year, and that was a sign that what was in place at that time was working well. well you have no training as a statistician or, a, or in any kind of risk assessment or analysis? I uh, no, I don't. And no. I, will, I would, I mean, I'm sure, I, again, I don't recall what specific questions I asked. I'm sure there would be questions that I would ask. But the impression I came away with, which I do recall, is that this was a system that was working. Right. Excuse me. Right. Now, can we go to page two uh, uh, under the heading Issues, Straight Decisions for New Ministers? And we need to scroll down to the fourth bullet point down there. 
and it says this, there is ongoing, albeit unfocused, concern about the impacts of modern construction methods and materials, which is in bold, particularly the wider use of combustible foam insulation and wood-based products, which can often result in larger fires. Now, I, I, you say you would have seen this document at the time. So can we take it that you would have seen that ongoing but unfocused concern articulated there? Uh, yes. Yes. W were you told in May 2015 of this specific concern regarding combustible foam insulation often resulting in bigger fires? Uh, I don't... I don't recall it having drawn specifically to my attention. I mean, clearly it's mentioned in this document. Um, but I don't at any time remember it being raised with me as a, an issue of particular concern or, or salient with the department or, any, or with an urgency around it. Right. D were you told at any time about any concern anybody in the department had about the use of combustible foam insulation by the industry on buildings above 18 metres? I don't recall having ever had a discussion to that effect. You were never told that there was... Uh, some evidence of widespread non-compliance in high-rise buildings. Again, I don't remember. I don't remember being told that. No. It, can we take it, or are we to take it that what we see in that bullet point there is the sum total you were told about a looming problem discovered by your officials about the potentially widespread use of combustible insulation materials above 18 metres? I, I certainly don't. I don't recall it any more focus being given to it or attention drawn to it than is represented in that document. It may have been mentioned in other documents that I received over the course of my time there, but I think that accurately reflects the um, it, extent to which it was drawn to my attention. Right. Are you able to account, as the minister responsible for this department and this piece of regulation and guidance, how it was that your officials failed to bring to your attention, in plain terms, a potentially endemic fire safety risk to thousands of occupants of high-rise buildings up and down the country? No, I'm not. And then below that, there's another bullet point. It says, a key decision for ministers will be to decide whether only life safety benefits are considered in deciding the effectiveness of fire safety provisions. What was that? What was your understanding of what that was? Um, I don't recall. Did it, did it mean to you at the time that the review would be focused and narrowed down only to those affecting life safety? I, I certainly don't recall having ever made a decision along those lines. Um, I would think, reading it now, that it means that as part of the process we were talking about, there would be decisions, decisions to be taken about <coughs> where the focus should be and what the final document should look like. But in my time, we never got to that stage. Can we then go to um, CLG 30-19294, BRAC? What I'm showing you here is a minute of a meeting on the 17th of June, 2015, of a BRAC meeting. Uh, and uh, if we go to item three on page two, uh, it, it says, Building Regulations Minister James Wharton visits BRAC. Uh, now, um, and it then goes on at 3.1. The chairman welcomed the minister and provided an introduction to BRAC focused on the diversity of ex expertise and experience of the committee and the range of areas covered from across the construction industry. Do you remember being present at this meeting? Vaguely. Vaguely. Um, do you remember whether you stayed for the whole of the meeting or only item three? Uh, I don't recall, but I would expect I stayed for only item three. Right. Uh, and uh, item three, two, starts like this. In response to questions on the four policy items identified for this agenda item, the main focus of the discussion that followed was, and then, then the first three bullet points are about you and what you're saying, thanking the committee, welcoming informal engagement, saying that you previously worked on the warm front, so aware of the possible issues relating to zero carbon buildings, and, and, and some Q&A. Uh, and then if you turn to the top of page three. Um, the last bullet point under this section, item three, is that the Minister welcomed Brack's views and ideas on areas for future consideration and requested that the committee write to him formally on the areas discussed. Do you think you left at that point? Uh, it then goes I don't. on to deal with 
Sorry, I don't recall, but I think it, it's quite possible. Right. Okay. Now, um, if we go to, to page seven, it, it, let's see if you were there for this. Um, item 10, Part B update. Officials provided an update on the research relating to Part B safety. Uh, and then at 10.4, uh, if you go to 10.4 on page 8, it was confirmed that a review of Part B was still planned, though this had yet to be signed off by the new ministers. On the assumption that a review of Part B will go ahead, BRAC members were asked to express an interest in taking part in a Part B working group, and various people then volunteered. Um, were you there for that part of the meeting? I, I don't think so. As I said, I don't remember the meeting in detail, but no, I think I, I, it was in my first meeting with BRAC, I think, and I, I went to introduce myself, say hello to meet them, and, and that was my role in the meeting. I don't think I stayed throughout. No. Okay. Did you get the, Did you receive this minute though to confirm or get your view on what is stated about what your role was? There was was accurate. Uh, I don't remember. Um, what was your understanding at the time of what needed to be signed off by you as at June twenty fifteen? It is the ten point four Part B. You're, refer you're referring to the um, Part B work. Uh, in relation to the review of approved document yeah. B, what was your understanding so I, of what I, it was that needed to be signed, it, signed off? I don't remember what my understanding was at the time. Um, <clears throat> Did you ask at the time, well, what is the progress on the discussion document, given that the deadline is the end of this month, June? I know I asked on a number of occasions what was happening with the um, review of Part B overall. I don't recall whether I asked specifically about that deadline and that document. Did you ask whether you were whether your officials were still on track to get that stage, the discussion document, completed by the deadline at the end of June? Again, I, I I asked on a number of occasions what the progress was or why there was delay. I don't recall whether I specifically asked about individual deadlines or exactly which time I, I made those requests or asked those questions. At this stage, June. 2015, how long did you expect the review of Part B to take to complete and be signed off by you? I, I don't recall. Was it clear in your mind, following your briefing that we've seen and the fourth line in the table we looked at at the end of May, that, um, that this would happen by 2016-17? Uh, I, I see no reason that I would have had to question that or doubt that. So. I would assume so, but I, I don't recall the detail of what I thought at that time. Do you remember having any feel at the time for whether that was achievable, given that the discussion document had uh, as yet not even been agreed? Um, sorry, I'm a little confused by the timeline. If, if uh, I can't, I don't recall when I became aware that the discussion document had not been agreed. But at the t I think at the time of this meeting, I was still expecting the discussion document. I don't. Right. Think I, I'm not aware of having been told that it was delayed at this <coughs> stage. Had you discussed the time frame, the deadline, 2016 to 17, at this time with Bob Bledsoe or anybody else? I don't recall. Now, um, when the discussion document... Sorry, if I could just... I mean, just to add to that, I would expect that insofar as uh, I discussed the work that was going to be undertaken to Part B, the time frame would have been set out to me as part of that. So I, whilst I don't recall having specifically asked the question, I, I'm almost certainly it would have been part of the discussion that, that, that we had and I would have relied on the advice I was given. Right. Now, um, at this point, though, let me just say that we're clear, were you still expecting the discussion document to be presented f to you for sign-off by the end of that month, June 2015? Uh, I would expect so, yes. Right. And certainly nobody had told you at that stage that it wasn't going to happen. Is, can we take it? Not that I remember, no. No. Now, um, the end of June 2015 came and went without the discussion document coming across your desk for signature. I think that, that, that as a matter of record, is correct, isn't it? Yes. Um, when it didn't appear before the end of June 2015, did you make inquiries as to why that was? Um, I don't recall. I remember making inquiries about the progress of that piece of work, as I say, on a number of occasions. I don't recall exactly when I asked or, or exactly which, whether I asked in a granular sense about individual stages of the work that was proposed. Now, the inquiries heard evidence that in the summer of 2015, a decision had been made by department officials 
to include the review of approved document B into a wider review of building regulations policy. And the reason that the inquiry has been given for that is that it was more likely that deregulation could be identified to balance out the regulation likely to follow from the review of approved document B. That's what we were told by <coughs> Bob Ledsom um, in his witness statement. Now, were you aware of that decision? I think I recall at some point being aware of it. It was, it was put to me that a bigger, a more comprehensive and larger piece of work would be an appropriate way to approach the issue, and I think I was agreeable to that. Um, whether I was aware of it in those terms, I, I don't remember. Did, do you remember having even an outline, a, dis a discussion with I, Bob Ledsom about it? I don't remember having a discussion with Bob, Le Bob Ledsom about it uh, specifically. I remember that I became, I was made aware, so it was either in a, a briefing document or in a discussion, that the proposal was for a comprehensive piece of work. That was, it was explained to me, <coughs> it was explained to me at the time why that was the case. And I remember being agreeable to that as it seemed a sensible way to proceed. And, uh, and you know, I was relying on the advice of those who were uh, experts in this area who said that is the right way to deal with this, this piece of work. Did, did it occur to you that by uh, locating the review of approved document B within a wider review of building regulations more generally and building control more generally, that would slow the process down and uh, delay the commitment made by the previous Secretary of State to the coroner? Um, I, I don't recall specifically the discussion, but that, that would make sense. However, my view at the time w was, would have been, that it is important to do the work properly. And if the advice from officials is that it should be a comprehensive piece of work taking into account a number of other factors that none of us that inter interlink and interact, then it's better to do the work right than to set off on a piece of work that will be incomplete and shouldn't be taken in isolation. Well, uh, was that your understanding, namely that in order to get the review of ADB right, you needed, to do a mu you needed to do a much wider review of the building regulations, including yes. parts which were not to do with fire safety, and building control generally? Yes. Who told you that? I don't recall, but that was my understanding. I'd like to understand the basis of that understanding. I, 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 can, only, I can only offer up I, the, the sort of logic and the advice that I would be given at the time, which was that these, these are documents which should be taken as a whole. Um, there is interaction between them. There, were, there are issues around, if you're going to look at issues of, of safety, you, look, you would logically look at issue, issues of inspection and how the, the, the system works. Um, I don't recall exactly when and in what form that discussion takes place, but I would be, uh, was agreeable to a broader piece of work in order to, as I would perceive it and was advised at the time, do the work properly, um, rather than to do something in isolation and possibly not get the best outcome. The reason, as I said to you, that um, th that decision was taken, as Bob Ledsom says it, w was that it was by doing that, more likely that deregulation, which would necessarily, uh, um, that deregulation could be identified to balance out the regulation that which would necessarily follow from ADB. In other words, ADB was folded into a wider review of building regulations and building control generally in order to cater for the effect of the deregulatory policy, the one in, two out, and then one in, three out agenda. Was that the basis of your understanding? Uh, that doesn't sound familiar to me. I would, it, if there was an opportunity to deregulate in a way that um, wouldn't have a negative impact, I would see that as a welcome thing to attempt to do. But my understanding is, as I set, set out to you, that the proper way to do this was comprehensively and thoroughly. And I, on that basis, understood that was what was being proposed. Right. Now, y you said in your statement, as we've seen, I don't need to go back to it with you, but you can't conceive, you said, that the deregulatory agenda could possibly have obstructed changes to regulations or guidance relating to fire safety. That was paragraph 18 of your statement. Given what Bob Ledsom has said, as I've put to you, do you accept that it was precisely because of, at least in his and his officials' mind, because of the deregulatory agenda uh, policy that the decision was taken to subsume the review of approved document B into a wider review of building regulations and building control in order to attempt to, an, uh, to achieve a net zero cost to, uh, to the regulatory changes. I don't recall that being my understanding at the time. Um, did you understand um, 
that the coroner's recommendations couldn't be adequately addressed without a complete review? Uh, so, again, I, to the best of my recollection, and it, it is six or seven years ago, um, my understanding was that the appropriate way to make amendments was to do a more comprehensive review, taking into account a number of factors that were important to get the right outcome. Um, against a backdrop of which I've been told the current system is working well, there are improvements you need to make. I was, I was then uh, given to understand that, that the best way to do that was comprehensively, and I felt that that was a reasonable way to proceed. Did you ever ask yourself, or ask your officials, the question, if we're going to fold the review of approved document B into a wider review of building regulations and building control, um, wh wh why is that necessary, or how will that leave the promise to address the coroner's recommendations by 2016-2017? So I, I don't recall the specific questions I asked. I will certainly have asked why are we doing this or why is this being proposed. And as I say, the, the understanding that I was left with was that in order to do this properly, it should take account of more <coughs> factors than just those in, in the one document. And my view was and would be that it's important to get the right outcome and to get a document that's fit for purpose at the end of this process. And so I would uh, be generally supportive of that advice that I was being given. Right. I mean, can you give us an insight into why it would be that Bob Ledson would not tell you that the reason why he had decided that it was a good thing to fold the, uh, the review of approved document B into a wider review was for the in order to serve the, de the deregulatory agenda. Why wouldn't he tell you that? I, I don't know. Uh, I don't recall having been told that. Um, and if that was the purpose, I would expect to see that reflected in a submission or document to that effect. Um, as far as I recall, I was advised this was the right and proper way to do, uh, uh, get the right outcome of what was a complex piece of work. And relying on that advice, I, I was supportive of that approach. Are you able to account for how your officials appear to have not only misunderstood the scope of the deregulatory agenda, uh, as you would have it, um, but to have um, used their understanding to justify a wider review which would necessarily delay the execution and delivery of the promise made by the previous Secretary of State to the coroner? Um, I'm not, um, but my understanding of the purpose of a wider review was to get the best possible outcome. Um, and because, again, as far as I can remember, the deregulatory agenda was not raised as a, a blocking issue with me with respect to this. Uh, I, I suspect, therefore, we didn't explore it. And I didn't, if I wasn't told this is the, this is the real reason we are doing this, Minister, then I wouldn't ask why. I mean, does it, help me with this, does it come to this, that either you're wrong and your deregulatory agenda cared not at all for the regulation of life safety, or you're right, but you and your ministerial predecessor had allowed your officials to labor under a fatal misapprehension. Uh, I, should, I, I don't know whether those are the only two possible interpretations of the facts, I, I, and I don't think it's for me to choose between them. Uh, well, can you think of a third? Um, well, as I say, the, 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 my, the, my understanding was that that was not the reason for the decision to do a more comprehensive review. Had anybody said to me at the time, this is why we are proposing this longer piece of work, then I would have asked questions about it and I'd have expected that to be reflected in the submissions I received, which would say, we are proposing to a more comprehensive piece of work because of the deregulatory agenda rather than for other reasons. Um, now, I don't recall having seen anything to that effect, but that is the extent of my memory of, of what took place. I don't really feel I should speculate further because um, I'm, I'm, I can tell you what I remember and, and the, the facts as I recall them. I, I, I don't have a, a fully formed view on, on how the policy should have interacted and what went wrong. That is, with respect, Mr Chairman, the purpose of part and part of this inquiry. Oh, I, I, yes, you're, you're, you're right about what we're doing, but I'm just seeking to see if you can account, as in explain, and perhaps take responsibility for what appears to have been a fundamental uh, misunderstanding between what you thought about the deregulatory agenda and what your officials have told us they thought. Now, 
Lord Wharton, I suggested to you two alternatives, uh, and you suggested that there might that that might not be the the universe of possibilities. Uh, I asked you for a third. I don't think you were able to give us one. I'll suggest one and see if, see what you make of it. And be frank, be frank about this. Are your officials, now when they're giving evidence to the inquiry, just blowing up the regulatory agenda out of all proportion as an excuse to cover up for their glacial progress? Uh, I, have no, I don't know. I, I have no reason to question or doubt any of the evidence that the officials have given to this inquiry. Now, let's move on in time. September 2015. Can we go, please, to CLG 30s 19301? This is uh, uh, an email sent by Richard Harrell on the 15th of September 2015 to your private office and that of the Secretary of State. Yes? Yes. Yes. Uh, and uh, it's copied to Peter Schofield, Sally Randall and Bob Ledsom. And it, the subject is Building Regulations Review and there are some attachments. Uh, uh, and uh, the... Uh, uh, the category is printed. I'm not quite sure that, whether that tells it, it tells us that it had to be printed for you. But um, what, is, what does that mean? I don't know. You don't know. Um, and the topic, as you can see, is proposals for a productivity review of building control. Now, did, would you have read this at the time, do you think? Uh, I would think so, yes. Uh, I'll, it, this looks like I mean, this is an email to my... It's gone to my assist, then assistant private secretary. Uh, so I wouldn't have seen this email unless it was, like I say, unless it was printed for me, and perhaps it was, I, I don't recall. If it was put in front of me, I would have read it. Right. Uh, now, um, <clears throat> I've assumed that you have read this submission at the time on the if basis of what you say in your first statement about it, or generally, and you say in your first statement of paragraph 16, I would ordinarily read submissions and annexes in their entirety when submitted to me. My apologies. I think I wouldn't have read this email it strikes me that the document that's attached to it is what I would have read. Um, and the email to me looks like a, effectively a copy and paste or summary of that submission. But it's the submission, not the email, that would have been given to me to read. I follow. Uh, well, let's just look at the recommendation in the email and then um, take it in stages. Um, if you um, look at uh, the recommendation, uh, in the second bullet point under it, paragraph three, second bullet, it says this, agree to the simplification program proposed for statutory guidance stroke approved documents and the outline program of work to cover the review, to review technical requirements of the building regulations, Annex B. Um, now, you may not have read that as you say, but you would have read the annex. Can we look at the submission, CLG 30019302? It's also dated the 15th of September 2015. It comes from Richard Harrell. And it goes to you and Greg Clark, yes? Yes. Yes. <clears throat> uh, it, it carries the same title, uh, and it has a summary. Is, th can we take it that you would have read this document, if not the covering email? Yes, I would, yes. Thank you. Now, um, if we go to page three, at the top of page three, it says this. Phase one, simplification program to October 2017. Work to minimize complexity and quantity of statutory guidance, simplify and harmonize guidance to improve ease of use and legibility, consolidate the building regulations to improve clarity and ease of application, and an ambitious program to move the approved documents fully online. We estimate this could potentially deliver 10 million pounds or more in annual savings to industry. And then phase two, to October 2019, detailed review of statutory guidance in key approved documents with a view to achieving deregulation where possible and to ensure technical guidance is otherwise fit for purpose and cost effective. We cannot estimate savings at this time, but the building control review in 2013 achieved deregulatory savings of 53 million pounds per annum and similar overall savings might be reasonably expected from this process. Uh, now, if you go to paragraph 11 on the same page, just look down if, with me, if you would, at the bold in the last part of that paragraph. It says, do you agree that we should work up the proposals for phase one and phase two as part of a discussion paper for publication later this year and for formal consultation next year? Before I ask you about that, uh, I'd like to look at Annex B uh, with you. 
because this is a submission. So we've seen the email. Here's the submission. Now we go to Annex B. This is at CLG 30019304. So we're now digging deep into the document you were sent. <coughs> Annex B is entitled Simplifying Statutory Guidance in the Approved Documents and Reviewing Technical Requirements. And if you go um, to uh, page three at the bottom, we can see that the work involved in phase two, in, it was entitled Reviewing Technical Requirements of the Building Regulations. And if we go to page four, we can see under the review of technical requirements, page four, under the second heading there, review of technical requirements of approved guidance. That work would include, in the first bullet point, end-to-end -end review of the technical requirements in the approved documents. Uh, and if you go to paragraph five, that's then spelt out in more detail, it would not be possible to undertake in-depth review of all of the technical requirements for all of the approved documents during this parliament, alongside emerging government priorities, energy efficiency of existing buildings, broadband, etc. See below. We therefore propose developing and publishing a new long-term timetable for review of specific parts to provide industry with certainty and allow DCLG to program substantive work streams with the resources available. And then if we go to page 6, paragraph 10, we can see there proposed program of work, we need to set out a program which maximizes deregulation whilst also meeting existing and emerging obligations. The Building Regulations and Standards Division is already committed in principle to a number of activities, specifically Part B, uh, fire safety, and then it goes on as follows. The previous SOS, Secretary of State, committed to undertaking review and simplification of Part B following the Lacknell House disaster, which was critical of the clarity and format of existing guidance which it was suggested contributed to a number of deaths. There are also a number of technical issues which recent research identifies as requiring attention in order to protect life safety. And then, and I'm sorry to show you so much of this before coming to a question, but if we look at page seven, we find the timetable. Uh, and under phase one, the timetable runs from October 2015 to October 2017. Yes? Mm -hmm. And phase one is simplification exercise with uh, parts E, sound, G, water safety and efficiency, H, waste and R, uh, broadband included there. Yes? Yes. Now you can see from what I've just read to you that the review of ADB isn't included in phase one, is it? Apart from... Uh, the simplification exercise. Uh, correct, yes. Yes. And you can see from phase two, larger scale deregulation, October 2015 to October 2019, so that's a four year span. There it, we see part B, technical review, listed, yes? Yes. Now, did you note at the time when you saw this document that the date for publication of the discussion document had been pushed back to sometime later this year? from the by the summer recess or end of June? Uh, I don't recall whether I specifically noted at the time, but I was aware there was delay. Right. Did you ask why there was a delay? I, I don't recall. Can you explain why the review had evolved into two parts, phases one and two, with the two ending in October 2019, even on your time scale, almost two years after the last date promised by the Secretary of State? So I, I can't remember how it was explained to me at the time or to what extent it was. Um, if I were to attempt to explain it, it would be that it's a larger and more complex piece of work than, than was initially envisaged, as we, we've, we've discussed. And I look at it, and it's not clear now when I look at this document, it would appear that phase two is running in parallel with phase one. Okay. So it's not that the complete phase one, then start phase two. This would, this would to my reading now, I'm, as I say, whilst I accept I saw this at the time, I don't recall the detail of the discussions I had. Um, would appear that the technical review is starting at the same time as phase one, but it's a bigger and longer piece of work, which wouldn't necessarily surprise me. Right. It, it looks from the, the body of Annex B here and the timeline here that no work on ADB apart from simplification uh, was envisaged in phase one, phase one for ADB. Uh, uh, well, that, that's true, but phase one would appear to run at the same in parallel with phase two on those timelines. 
In what phase, one or two, as you understood it at the time, was the work to be done that would address the coroner's recommendations? I, I don't recall the detail of my understanding at the time. Did you ask that question? I don't remember. And we have no evidence that you did. Can we take it that you didn't? No, I don't remember. Um, I, from the documents that I've seen, there are uh, large segments of activity for which there isn't evidence. It doesn't mean that they didn't take place. No, I understand. I mean, when you say I don't remember, do you remember I don't remember doing it one way or the other? I might have done, or I don't recall doing it, and therefore I'm confident now that I didn't. Um, the former, in as much as I would uh, use the words that you've chosen, but this was six or seven years ago, and I don't remember the detail of the discussions that I had at that time. Was it nonetheless clear in your mind at the time, having seen this document, that the deadline remained 2016 to 17 for delivering on the promises to the coroner? Um, it would appear clear from this document that that deadline was no longer going to be delivered on. Mm. Did you have any thoughts about where that uh, left the public commitment by the previous Secretary of State? Uh, I don't recall. Um, I know that I understood there was delay. And so, yes, I would understand that that would therefore mean, and I remember being at, at various stages frustrated by some of the delay, but uh, the extent to which I then uh, it, it drew, the, drew the line between that and the commitment in the letter to the coroner, I don't, I don't recall. I, I just knew that the work needed to be undertaken. I'd been told that it, the best way to do it was more comprehensively. And this is what I was presented with as a a summary and in order to get agreement to the work that was being proposed. If we go back to page six of this document, paragraph 10, we see there, uh, <coughs> under part B, as I've read to you, um, the, a reference to the Lacknell House disaster. Now, I, correct me if I'm wrong, Lord, Lord Wharton, but this is the first reference in any submission to you about the Lacknell House fire, the inquest, and the recommendations made. We saw reference in the, um, in the fourth line of the document in the June, but this is the first time we can see a submission on that. Did this submission prompt you to ask or to see exactly what the recommendations were? I don't recall. Right. Were you not interested when you were told here that the previous Secretary of State had made a commitment to undertaking a review and simplification of Part B following the Lacknell House disaster, etc. Did you not want to at least look at um, what the coroner's recommendations were that the Secretary of State had committed to? As I say, I had a number of discussions and briefings and um, documents and, and so on about this. Of course, I was interested in it. I don't recall the specific questions I asked for, or what, what they were or which parts of it I asked questions about as a result of getting this particular submission. Right. I, I mean, would you agree, looking at it, uh, that the submission here is setting out the fact that the existing guidance had attracted criticism from the coroner following the Lacknell House fire? Yes. Yes and that it was suggested by the coroner that, that the guidance may have contributed to the number of deaths, sorry, to a number of deaths. Yes. Yes. And that there were technical issues, live issues, that required attention in order to protect life safety. Yes, yes, that's correct. Did you not wonder why that information was buried away on page six of Annex B to this submission, as opposed uh, to being put in large letters on the front, even of the email, for your attention? Well, I, I certainly think, reflecting on it now, it should have been more prominently at the forefront of the document, but I wouldn't use the term buried away. It, it's part of a document that sets out the entirety of the proposals in this area for approval. It's, it's not hidden, and Lacknell was specifically referred to it. I, I think it could, have been more, it could have been clearer, and if I were reviewing the way that uh, submissions are written, for example, I think highlight, it would be helpful in this document to highlight that one of the effects of what's proposed here is to delay the um, publicly committed to deadline for work that was going to be undertaken. But I wouldn't nonetheless describe this as hidden away. I mean, it's very clearly the first be a quite prominent part of the document. Right. Uh, and did you understand it as such, that even though it was on page six within Annex B, it was nonetheless prominent, prominent enough for you I, I would certainly, I, uh, again, again I, I don't recall exactly what I thought at the time, but one of the things that your attention would always be drawn to in a submission that's requiring approval to undertake some work is the, the proposed programme of work section or its equivalent, which is 
a key part of the document saying this is what we want, we're going to do if you approve it. Right. Uh, looking at the, the second sentence in that part, there are also a number of technical issues which recent research in, identifies as requiring attention in order, in order to protect life safety. Did you ask what the, those technical issues were? I, as I don't recall the questions that I asked following receiving this document. Were you not concerned that they hadn't been spelt out for you? Uh, as I say, I don't recall the <coughs> questions that I asked. Right. Um, did you not... Uh, think to yourself when you saw um, what we see there under Part B, fire safety, that that was inconsistent with the line that you had got from officials, which was that the current system was working well. Um, I don't recall, again, what I specifically thought about it, but my understanding that the system was working well, but there is some work that we are proposing to make further improvements those are not, they're, they're, to me, they're not inconsistent <coughs> understandings of, of where things were as presented to me at that time. Were well, they really not? I mean, I'd like to understand that. How could the fact that the coroner <coughs> had been critical of the clarity and format of the existing guidance, which it was suggested contributed to a number of deaths, and that there were other outstanding technical issues which were needed attention to protect life safety, uh, um, how could that be consistent with the notion that the current system was working well, subject to a few improvements? Well, you, the system, as I say, I, the understanding I had was, and the briefings that I given were that the system was, was effective and deaths from fires were decreasing and was generally working well, but there were improvements that could be made. And against that, you have the backdrop of new materials, the way that... Um, the way that we construct buildings evolving. There were questions around the way that inspections and so on are done that we discussed earlier, although focused in other areas. And the issue of simplification was one that has been a, you know, was consistent throughout, not just in this, but in other areas, where improvements could be made. Something can be working well without being as good as it can possibly be. But if you're going to make changes to it, my view is that you do them comprehensively and thoughtfully, and particularly in areas that are as technical and important as this, after full and proper consultation with appropriate stakeholders and experts. And did this submission here not alert you to the fact that there were urgent and live issues regarding life safety, fire safety, that needed to be addressed, which the then current guidance wasn't addressing, notwithstanding the line that was being fed to you by your officials, that all was working well? Did no, that not occur it, to you? It, it, this, this drew to my attention that there was work that needed to be undertaken, and this is the submission proposing that work. And that's why I would agree to it. If, if, if my view had been nothing needs to be done, then I would have declined approval to undertake this piece of work. My view was something needs to be done. Here is a plan for that from people on whose advice I rely. They tell me this is the right way to do it. It looks on the face of it reasonable. Therefore, I will prove it and support this piece of work being undertaken. So it was your thought that notwithstanding <coughs> being told that <coughs> uh, the uh, Lacanal House disaster, the, the Lacanal inqu inquest was critical of the clarity and format of the existing guidance, which had possibly contributed to a number of deaths and the existence of technical issues of, uh, which had identified the need to protect life safety. Notwithstanding those matters, the system was working well. Was well, that your view? My view was, and it, my understanding at the time was, that there are improvements that we need to look at making, and this is the right way to do it, but that overall the system is fit for purpose. Now, I'm not saying that my view today, I think, uh, again, not wishing to preempt what findings might be, um, but if I'm asked to explain how I understood it at that time from the briefings that I'd had, was my understanding was that the building regulations were working well, but improvements could and, and would be made and this was a plan for an appropriate process to ensure that was done properly. Right. But looking at it now, admittedly with the benefit of hindsight, what should you have been told? Uh, with the benefit of hindsight, that uh, I, what, it, what is, I think has become apparent, and again being very careful not to preempt any of the, the findings of this process, that, that there were far more concerns being raised than were drawn to my attention and all that I was aware of at the time and that uh, the urgency and seriousness of what needed to be changed was much greater than I was led to understand or the understanding that I took from the information that I was given.
did it occur to you <coughs> that the work to simplify and clarify approved document B could actually be separated out from the wider review and undertaken as a short, more urgent project? project? Uh, I don't recall specifically, but I, I, I know that my understanding once either one, once I'd had discussion about it, my understanding certainly at the point at which um, this had been approved was that the appropriate way to do it was to was to do both pieces of comp effectively combine both pieces of work. That it would be a mistake to do one piece of work without taking into account the other. Right. Now uh, you attended a meeting with Peter Schofield, Sally Randall, Bob Ledsom, and Richard Harrell on the nineteenth of October, twenty fifteen, to discuss this submission. I think. Do you remember that? Uh, I don't recall it, but I accept it's very likely. Right. Um, <clears throat> uh, let, let's um, look at your first statement, please. Page five, paragraph 15. Uh, uh, and you say there in the fifth line up from the bottom that, um, as mentioned below, I do remember at some stage raising the issue of the speed of the review, and I was told that it was a complex matter which could not be foreshortened. I couldn't remember precisely what happened. Uh, and um, you, you make the same point in a, a number of other areas of your statements. Um, is, is it likely, therefore, that you raised the speed of the review with your officials, uh, either before or at this meeting in, in October 2015? Uh, yes, I think it's likely. Yes. And uh, you were told that it would be comprehensive because of the way different parts of the building regulations interacted, I think. Is that right? Again, that sounds right, yeah. Yeah. Uh, and um, you, you accepted all that. Now, um, if we go to paragraph 10 of your second witness statement, please, at page 4, <coughs> uh, you also say there that, I, you say, I also recall, uh, this is very, very end of the page, I also, and then turn the page to page 5, I also recall understanding that the review would encompass the work outlined in Eric Pickles' response to the Lackal House Coroner's recommendations. Did you discuss with anybody at the meeting in October 2015 within which phase the work to address the coroner's recommendations would be addressed? I don't remember. Or the deadline of the 2016-17 for delivering on the Secretary of State's promise to the coroner? I, I have very little memory of that meeting. Right. I don't remember. I mean, did it occur to you that it was now going to be quite seriously delayed. I think it did. Uh, certainly the issue of delay is one that I've revisited a number of times. Right. Now let's go then to November 2015. CLG 1000 uh, And this is a submission dated 10th of November 2015 from Alex Murphy, cleared by Bob Ledsom, and it comes to you and Greg Clark copy to other ministers, and the title is Simplification of Building Regulations and the Building Control System. Did you read this at the time? I would assume so. I don't recall specifically, but if it was put in my box, I would have read it. Can we go please to page 3, paragraph 14? First bullet point down, uh, under paragraph 14. This is under the heading Program and Next Steps, and it says this. Publication of, of a discussion document in early 2016 to set out direction of travel. This is an important first step to engage with industry and gather ideas. We will coordinate publication with cutting red tape review process. Now, it, it's clear, uh, or well, was it clear when you read this, that the publication date for the discussion document was now not only not end of June 2015, nor late in 2015, as the 15th of September submission had suggested, uh, but early 2016. In other words, it, this was now the second pushback date. Yes. Yes. Uh, and if you look at the second bullet point from the bottom of the page, revise ADs published for external review, second half of 2017. Now, uh, I know it wasn't your view at the time, but assuming that the Eric Pickles deadline for delivering on the commitments to the coroner was March 2017, as others have told us, then this submission would be confirmation that that deadline was now definitely going to be missed. Yes. yes. And even on your own understanding uh, of the <coughs> meaning of 2016 to 17, second half of 2017 would be late in the, late <coughs> in the window, wouldn't it? 
um, two year window. And that, yes, and that's only still for <coughs> external review publications. I think it's clear from this that, that deadline would be missed, yes. Uh, indeed. Thank you. Um, but you, you, you say in your first statement, paragraph 15, we don't need to go to it, that you now see that the change in time frame had not been highlighted in this submission. You have no recollection of it and can't say why you weren't aware of it at the time. But help me with this. How, how ought that change in the timetable have been flagged to you? Uh, I would propose there should be a very clear reference in this, probably given the importance of it. Uh, bold and bold, in bold and at the beginning to say this means we are going to miss a commitment that you have publicly that has been publicly made by previous Secretary of State and by the Department. How ought um, the the change? I see. So and it wasn't. Sorry. Uh, it, it I wasn't don't recall it. I, mean, I, I haven't got the full document in front of me, but I don't mm. recall at any stage that being as front and centre as you would expect something of that importance to be. But if you had read this document. <coughs> carefully, as I know you have in preparation to give evidence, you would have noticed that the deadline had slipped back by now a total of some nine months. Yeah, correct. And you would have noticed that there was no way that the promise made by the Secretary of State, previous Secretary of State, to the coroner was going to be met? Uh, yes. But can we take it at the time you didn't notice that? Uh, I, don't I don't recall when I first became aware that the deadline wouldn't be met, but um, throughout the issue of delay to this process was a live one on one with which I was engaged in the department. Did any thought get given by you or your officials to telling the coroner that because of various matters happening within, within the department, the Secret Secretary of State's promise to her for a full review of ADB by 2016, 2017 would now no longer be met. I don't recall having ever had a discussion about writing to the coroner about it. Right. Did you yourself not uh, wonder whether the coroner ought to be told that the promise that had been given to her by the Secretary of State was no longer going to be met? Uh, I, I don't know whether that would be normal procedure, um, but I don't recall having thought of writing to the coroner myself, no. Was there, was there a sense at all of any urgency in getting on with the work, at least trying to meet the, the, the uh, deadline promised to the, cor to, to, to the coroner by the Secretary of State? Uh, there was certainly on my part um, a clearly conveyed sense of frustration at the delay, um, whether it was with reference specifically to keeping the coroner updated on progress, I, I don't recall it having been so. You say there was certainly on your part a clearly conveyed sense of frustration at the delay. To whom did you express that sense of frustration? Um, again, I don't remember the exact incidents and moments when it happened, but through my private office, um, I can remember asking the question and, and raising the issue of delay on a number of occasions. So it would have been conveyed to the, the team, I assume through Bob Ledson, but I can't say who my private office would have related to. I think there are some, if I recall correctly, some documents to that effect in the And what were you told? Revealed. Um, it, it effectively due to the, the so far as I recall, the, the complexity and the need to do the work properly. And that, the, you know, that it was better to do a comprehensive and thorough piece of work than it is to do something quickly and, and, and possibly come out with an outcome that is uh, not fit for purpose or suboptimal. But you say you accepted that as an explanation? Yes. So why were you frustrated at the delay then? I think that there were several moments of further delay. Which were what? Well, we, we've just looked at two documents that show two different um, stages on which things were pushed back. And I think I had, a, I had a general irritation with the fact that something that I kept being told, here's the date we're going to do it, seemed to always run away from us when we got close to it. But I can't say that I specifically recall the incidents, the, moment, the moments at which I raised these concerns. I know that throughout, on a number of occasions, I raised concern with delay. If you had been given, as you say, good reasons why there was now delay, why were you concerned? Well, you can be given good reasons for one delay and then 
told this is what the, what we think the times our timelines will be. If there is then further delay, then you, you you question whether the sufficient planning thought of timelines had gone into what was explained to you the first time. Right. It's, it's you sort of I, it, delay is I'm I'm afraid not uncommon in government. This is, is something that sadly to some expect, extent you expect and get used to. I think on this the, there were more incidences of delay than you would normally expect. Can we then go to CLG 1007855? Uh, now, this is an email from your private office to the Permanent Secretary of State, Greg Clark, 7th of December 2015. Uh, and um, y your assistant, Sarah Morgan, says uh, this, if you look at the second bullet down, in particular, para 10, he, I think that's you, mm -hmm. uh, wants yes. to look at legislative vehicles to make improvements and repeal redundant provisions. He thinks one thing we could look at doing through this is enabling AIs, that's approved inspectors, to undertake more of the types of work currently solely the responsibility of LAs local authorities, um, para nine. Now, do you accept that by repealing redundant provisions and simplifying language, the department, you, the Secretary of State, would not be addressing issues of substance highlighted by the coroner? Uh, yes, I, 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 I would say I'm not I'm on top of the entire context of this at the time, but I, I don't think that that, was the, that wasn't the sole piece of work with which we, we would look at. So, that, for example, reference the approved inspectors, I don't think is related to the work, the um, recommendations of the coroner. So I, I would have a general view that repealing redundant provisions is a good thing to do. Right. So this is part of the wider review, particularly of building control, rather than anything to do with I, the coroner's recommendations and the Secretary of State's promise. I would suggest, I, I would think so reading it now, that this is part of the, the wider review, yes. Whether it overlaps with or, or, in, or interacts with the coroner's recommendations, I, I don't recall from reading this now. Let's then go to the spring of 2016, Lord Wharton. CLG 30 is 19344. This is a submission dated the 1st of April 2016. Uh, and we can see it um, from Richard Harrell to you, cleared by Bob Ledson. Title, Simplification of Building Regulations and Building Control Systems, Next Steps. Um, do you remember receiving this? Uh, I don't, but I'm, I'm confident that I will have received it. Um, it refers to an Annex C, as we'll come to. That was also sent to you a few days later. Just looking at this document, paragraph 2, timing, uh, uh, it says, normal course of business but an early response will enable us to do the work to allow, if you decide, publication of the discussion document in early May. Now, looking at that, did you realise at the time that the timetable had now shifted back from the end of June 2015 to later in 2015 and then early 2016 and now early May 2016? So this is yet a further pushback for the discussion document. So I, I don't recall specifically um, what I realised or understood at that time, but in line with uh, my previous comments, this, this would be another example of that, that deadline effectively seeming to run away from uh, from me and from what we're proposing to do. And did you ask why the discussion document was yet again delayed, now for the third time? So again, I don't, I don't recall what I asked specifically um, upon receiving this, but a number of times I asked the question about delay. And were you given a good reason, as to, or any reason, why it was being delayed now for the third time? I don't recall. Do you remember asking questions about um, how come your officials had um, been over-optimistic the previous year, at least twice. Uh, I certainly remember asking questions on a number of occasions about delay. Um, as I say, one of the responses I give and the one that sticks in my mind we've discussed, which was the, the nature of having a more comprehensive review um, and doing the work in its entirety. Uh, but I don't remember exactly what I asked upon receiving this particular submission. Who, who did you have those conversations about delay with? Uh, primarily, it would be through my private office. So I would exp I would ask my assistant private secretary or private secretary to raise and th these issues. They would go back and uh, give me a response. It may well be that I had that that discussion directly with Bob, Led Bob Ledsom on one or more occasions, but I don't recall. Uh, I just recall that it was an issue that I had raised. 
did you have any thoughts at the time as to whether publication of in early May 2016 uh, of the discussion document was feasible? Uh, I don't recall. Even if uh, that deadline had been met, do, do you accept, as we've been told, that the Secretary of State would also have to sign it off? Um, yes, I mean, I, I would expect so, and I think looking at the timing of this, I would expect almost anything published by the Department would have been scrutinised quite then, closely. And then after that, there would be a, a right round mm -hmm. process across government, yes? Uh, yes. Whether it, yes, I'm at some stage in making changes, yes. Mm -hmm. I, I haven't got in my mind at the moment the exact timeline of what happens when, <coughs> um, but there would need to be a right round process for yeah. any changes, yes. So in light of that, was it really realistic for the discussion document to be ready for publication in early May 2016, given that you'd not even seen a draft on the 1st of April? I would say it's an ambitious timetable, um, given the date of this document. Looking at the bottom of page two, we can see that Annex C, uh, 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 right <coughs> at the foot of the page, is identified. And it's, an, as it says, an outline timetable for building regulations review work. Uh, now, um, let's go to that document, CLG 1000-8122. It, it's actually entitled Annex B, but it is the timeline nonetheless. When you were sent this, as you were on the 6th of April 2016, did you read it? Uh, I, well, yes, I will have. <clears throat> I'm just... it, it does look familiar to me. I mean, the detail of it isn't, but it, there's a, it's quite a, a striking document. And I, I can remember, I think I can, I can vaguely recall thinking it looked complicated at the time. <laughs> yes. Well, just to be clear for the record, you did receive it on the 6th of April, and there's an email to your office, CLG 1000-8121, just for the record, I don't need to show it to you. Mm -hmm. um, we can see, if we look at it together, that it projects that the approved documents will be finalised in the first half of 2018. Yes? Uh, yes. You can see that there's a, there's a middle blue rectangle uh, uh, which straddles end of 2017 down to Q2 2018, finalise approved documents. Can yes. you see? Yes, I can see that. Yes. And did that relate, as you understood it, to the phase one work, the simplification of approved documents? Uh, I don't recall what my understanding was or whether I asked specific questions about it at the time. So um, as I look at it now, I, I would think that that potentially makes sense, yes, but it's a, it's a complex and not entirely clear uh, timeline. No, you're, well, did you, uh, did, when you got it, did you go back to anybody and say, this is complex and not entirely clear? I, I don't recall. Um, well, you can see that when it says finalise approved documents, I, I, it doesn't, does it... Um, split the two phases between simplification of approved documents and technical review. That's correct. Did, you, did that occur to you at the time when you saw this? I don't recall. It's an obvious question, isn't it, given that you've it's, been given these two phases? Yes, and, and I would like to be able to say, oh, yes, but I, I, I don't remember. Did you notice, leaving aside <clears throat> that problem of complexity, that the timetable had slipped... Um, from October 17 for the phase one simplification exercise uh, to uh, Q2 2018. I, I don't recall. Uh, or, or alternatively, uh, that the technical review enabling complete finalization of the approved documents ha had suddenly come back by about 16 months from October 2019 uh, to um, end of June 2018, mysteriously. Yeah, I, I say I, the document looks familiar to me. Uh, I don't remember what questions or comments I had uh, right. after having received it. Uh, did it not strike you at the time as mysteriously inconsistent with the timetable projected to, with, in the two phases in the pr um, submission that you'd received in November? Uh, it may well have done, but I don't recall. Right. Now, you, in your first witness statement, you say that the extension to the time frame identified here was not highlighted in the submission itself. That's what you say in your first statement, paragraph 16. We don't need to go to it. But let's look at paragraph... Let's go to your second statement, paragraph 13, page 5. Uh, you say there, <coughs> uh, uh, and this is in the context of this document, uh, and what you say in your first statement, 
in your first statement, it's quoted, you say, I note the change in the time frame is not highlighted in the submission, paragraph 15. However, I note again that the extension to the time frame is not highlighted in the submission itself, and I do not now recall whether or not I noticed it for myself, paragraph 16. So that, that neatly encapsulates your evidence in the first statement. Question, do you consider that the changes in time frame ought to have been highlighted to you? If so, to whom would this responsibility have fallen? And you say this, the purpose of a submission such as this is to seek ministerial approval on an informed basis. And in my view, the change in the time frame was, an, was important information which ought to have been made clear to me. I do not think it is reasonable to expect a minister or his or her private office to have to remember or cross-refer to previous submissions in order to spot important changes like this. And in my view, a minister should be entitled to expect a submission to set out all relevant facts in a clear and straightforward way. The individuals in the building regulations team who drafted and approved this submission ought, in my opinion, to have highlighted the change in the timetable clearly in the submission. In an ideal world, my private office would also have identified the change before the submission went into my box and asked the building regulations team to amend the submission accordingly. However, with the quantity of work my private office dealt with on a daily basis, it is unrealistic to expect them to have time to descend to this level of detail in scrutinising submissions. Now, would I be right in thinking that you stand by that paragraph I've just read to you yes. today? Yes. Now, looking back at the submission then, please, CLG 3019344, go, go to paragraph 6 in it. of page one, under the heading Simplification and Review of Technical Requirements. And it says this, we have started work on simplifying the approved documents and developing options to simplify regulations and legislation to support improved productivity and reduce cost for industry. This will go hand in hand with technical review of some parts of the regulations with a view to identifying opportunities for simplification and deregulation. And did that cause any confusion in your mind about what work would be done when? Uh, I don't recall that it did, but I don't recall my reaction to this document. As I say, I'm sure I will have seen it right. at the time. Um, looking at it now, I, mean, I don't think it's as clear as, as perhaps it could be, but it would reinforce the view I had when we looked at the two phases that they, are, that they were things that could be run in parallel, the technical and the simplification work. In parallel? But did you think that the technical work would be done within the simplification phase now? Mm -hmm. In other words, they would not only be run in parallel, but the two ends would, would be um, coexistent. I mean, I don't recall what I thought on reading that, but that's not necessarily how I would interpret that. Um, but go, looking at <coughs> the statement you've read from my witness statement a moment ago, I, I think this is, this is part of the, the point which I was making, which, and I apologise if I deviated from giving simply a factual account and gave an opinion, but reading submissions should be to assist ministers in understanding the position and making decisions. It shouldn't be akin to trying to interpret a murder mystery novel. You, you, don't, you, you shouldn't be trying to figure out what it really means. It should be clear on the face of it. And I, and I think it is fair to say that, taken as a whole, these submissions are not. Can we go to paragraph 14 of your second statement then, page 6? Uh, and you say, all of that said, I'm doubtful whether anything would have been different had the change in time frame been drawn to my attention. I would have probably have asked for an explanation for the delay, and as previously indicated, though I cannot now recall, it is possible that I identified the change for myself and asked for an explanation as, as a result. However, my experience is that everything happens slowly in the civil service, and the likelihood is that nothing I could have done would have speeded the review up. Uh, now, if you had been aware of the delay <clears throat> and sought to unpick the mysteries of this document, um, would you not have wanted to investigate precisely what the technical issues, the live technical issues were within ADB, which required attention in order to protect life safety? Uh, well, so I'm, I'm, I was aware of delay throughout, as we have discussed, and frustrated by it. Um, I think that when I look back, one of the things that could have been given more, that, uh, that could have resulted in more pressure being put to, brought to bear to ensure work was done in a timely manner, or indeed the question that I could have asked being, is a matter of resourcing one of the issues around whether there is delay, um, I think I may, may have pushed that issue harder 
had it had it been more at the forefront of my mind. But I, I mean, ultimately, um, paragraph fourteen of my statement there captures my understanding of my time as a minister in that department. Do you, it was, I think, in in your gift though to ask whether there could be a split and whether the life safety critical changes needed to approve document B could be accelerated and treated as a separate project? Uh, it was certainly within uh, my gift to ask whatever I liked as the minister. Um, as I have said, the, I did ask a number of questions around this and I don't recall specifically what they were, but the understanding that I was given from the advice I received was that the right way to undertake this work was as a whole and separating out specific bits would potentially result in suboptimal sub or inappropriate changes or even unintended negative consequences. So I, I wasn't, I, yeah, I was reasonably convinced by the general argument that this needs to be done comprehensively and taken as a whole, and I, I still find that plausible. Separately from that, the delay is an area in which I think that it could have been clearer and uh, it could have been more directly addressed, particularly <coughs> in the submissions that I received. Is it fair to say that you took the advice that you received from your officials about the programme of work at face value? Uh, no, I, I, mean, I, I did ask questions <coughs> about it and pushed on it, and that's why, I, for example, when I asked about delays, I, it was explained to me. Um, ultimately, it was explained to me in a way that I found convincing. Yes, and took those explanations at face value? Um, well, it took at face value, to, to me, would, would imply that didn't ask questions and just accepted it, and I don't think that was the case. Or ultimately, I accepted the advice that I was given. Yes. Were you left, therefore, with the understanding that even though there may have been urgent technical life safety issues and defects in the approved document identified by the coroner which had contributed to the lacrimal deaths, those could not be cured separately from a full drains up review of approved document B, which was now going to take one into 2017 and 20, perhaps out to 2019. I was convinced of the argument that the review should be done comprehensively. Mr Chairman, it's a minute short of one o'clock, but I'm going, to, um, I'm, going to, I'm going to suggest that this is an appropriate moment for a break. I think that's a very appropriate <coughs> suggestion, Mr Minute. Yes, thank you. Well, Lord Wharton, it's time we all had a break, a chance to get some lunch. So we'll stop there. We'll resume, please, at 2 o'clock. And again, please don't talk to anyone about your evidence or anything relating to it while you're out of the room. All right? Thank, Thank you, you very much. Thank you. Would you go to the usher, then, please? <coughs> Thank you very much. 2 o'clock, please. Thank you.